Welcome back students. Now in this session of gynecological oncology, we will be discussing about a pre-malignant condition and a malignant condition. The pre-malignant condition in this video we will be discussing is a cervical intraepithelial neoplasia followed by cervical cancer which is a malignant condition. So now let's start from the basics. Okay guys, what exactly is this transformation zone and how it is important in the topic of CIN as well as cervical cancer. See, this transformation zone, in the name itself, it's very clear that there is some transformation is happening. So, what is that thing which is getting it transformed? Please concentrate that your endocervix or the cervical, in the cervical canal, like you know, that endocervical part is lined by the columnar epithelium. Okay? And the exocervix, which is more toward the vagina, the exocervix is lined by the a squamous epithelium okay so exocervix is lined by squamous epithelium and endocervix is lined by columnar epithelium so the junction where the columnar epithelium being converted into a squamous epithelium that junction this junction is known as a squamo columnar junction or transformation zone so there is a transformation of the columnar epithelium into squamous epithelium so what kind of change is this guys it's a metaplastic change it's a metaplastic change which is happening in the transformation zone so this is the first important point and this transformation zone it's a dynamic point what does i mean by dynamic point it usually moves inwards and it moves outward please concentrate this transformation zone will be taken in with the age so with the increase in age this transformation zone will be sucked in into the cervix more towards the cervix into the cervix but during pregnancy during puberty and with the usage of oral contraceptive agents this transformation zone is more likely to be exposed outward okay so it moves outward with the pregnancy puberty and with the ocp drug usage now, where exactly this transformation zone is located? Theoretically, we know it is the junction between the endocervix and exocervix. So, where exactly the location? See, this is a very important MCQ. It is located 1.7 to 2.3 centimeters from the external loss. Okay, from the external loss, it is located away 2.3 centimeters. This is a important MCQ which you should know for your exam. So, what is the importance of this transformation zone? The importance is such that this is the site for the dysplastic changes to happen and neoplastic changes to happen. So, this transformation zone is the most common site for a pre-malignant condition that is cervical intraepithelial neoplasia and also for the malignant condition which is the cervical cancer. So, both cervical cancer and CIN are more likely to be arise from the transformation zone or squamocolumnar junction. Now, what you should know from this image? Guys, please concentrate that in this image, you are having a red color area. See, this red color area which you are seeing here is the endocervix. Surrounding the endocervix, this pale white color area, the pale white color area which you are seeing is the, this is the white color area. That that's what is the squamocolumnar junction or transformation zone. Surrounding the white color region, you are having a pink color area. So, this pink color area is your exocervix. Guys, please concentrate that the pinkish region is the exocervix and the endocervix is more reddish in color and the transformation zone is a pale white in color. Now, what else you can identify from this image? Guys, usually, during pervaginal examination, you are not supposed to see the endocervix, okay. Usually endocervix is more inside, no. So, you, you can't see endocervix, but in this image, you can see that the endocervix is a bit towards outside. So, this condition is known as ectropion, okay. Ectropion. So, what is meant by ectropion, guys? Ectropion means the endocervix is getting exposed to the outside. 
so this ectropion is not a dangerous condition this will be happening even during the pregnancy okay that's not a big thing see after seeing important points about the transformation zone let's talk about the cervical intraepithelial neoplasia cervical intraepithelial neoplasia is a pre malignant condition with the dysplastic changes happening in the squamocolumnar junction or transformation zone see according to the dysplastic changes there is a classification of this cin into cin1 cin2 cin3 and carcinoma in situ the important point i want to you to know here is see there are two classifications that is a cin classification and bethesda classification see they are one and the same cin1 according to bethesda classification is a l cell okay even if you don't understand don't worry all the concept will be clear see l cell means what low squamous intraepithelial lesion okay or low grade squamous intraepithelial lesion and cin2 cin3 and carcinoma in situ according to bethesda classification they are regarded as high grade lesions first of all what are the characteristics of this cin1 cin2 cin3 carcinoma in situ or what are the characteristics of this l cell and h cell they are one and the same please concentrate if i am talking about cin1 the dysplastic cells are present in the lower one third of the epithelial lining of the cervix okay they are only located to the lower one third now if i am coming to cin2 there is a moderate dysplasia or bit more dysplasia now the dysplastic cells are seen in lower two third cin1 is lower one third cin2 is lower two third of the epithelial lining of the cervix is getting affected with the dysplastic cells now you have talking about cin3 the dysplastic cells are seen more than two third more than two third of the epithelial lining of the cervix have undergone the dysplastic changes okay now last thing is carcinoma in situ it is still in okay what does i mean by in you will get to know don't worry carcinoma in situ means the dysplastic cells are seen in the full thickness of the epithelial lining but the basement membrane is still intact guys please concentrate in cin1 it's a very mild dysplasia only lower one third of the cervical lining is affected in cin2 moderate dysplasia more than like not more than two thirds of the cervical lining is affected with the dysplastic cells in cin3 more than two third of the cervical lining is affected and with the carcinoma in situ the total the total length of the cervical lining is affected with the dysplastic changes but keep that point in mind the basement membrane is still intact okay there is no breach in the basement membrane once if there is a breach you should call it as a cancer why because these dysplastic cells now they will undergo metastasis now it's a perfect neoplasia okay now the same thing cin1 cin2 cin3 we have seen carcinoma in situ and their characteristics we have seen now the same characteristics will be there even for the l cell and h cell what does it mean by l cell according to bethesda classification according to bethesda classification l cell means the dysplastic changes are localized or limited to lower one third of the lower one third of the epithelial lining of the cervix and h cell means h cell includes cin2 cin3 and carcinoma in situ to make things more clear let me show you a image guys this is something normal okay here this one is something normal like you now this is the these are the normal cervical epithelial cells and these are the basal epithelial cells of the cervical lining and this is the basement membrane this is the basement membrane which i am showing you here please concentrate in cin1 see the basal epithelial cells are being affected how much lower one third only now in cin2 cin2 the dysplastic cells are getting more increased that is two third now in cin3 more than two third is getting affected but if i am talking about carcinoma in situ see in carcinoma in situ the whole thickness 
the whole thickness of the cervical epithelial lining is affected with the dysplastic changes but basement membrane is still intact it is still intact but please concentrate in carcinoma like you know in the next image if there is a breach in the basement membrane once the basement membrane is breached or broken now this dysplastic cells are now like you know they are coming out so now this stage is a perfect carcinoma this is invasive carcinoma or like you know the cervical cancer is now getting started so till here i can say it's a pre malignant okay there is no metastasis but from here there is a breach in the basement membrane now cancer is spreading okay now in this image you can also get some more additional information what is that so you can ask me why there is this dysplastic changes why why there are like you know these kind of abnormal changes happening in the squamocolumnar junction the reason for this changes is because of the infection with the hpv see this hpv human papilloma virus is going to affect your basal epithelial cells okay this is the important mcq the basal epithelial cells in the cervical lining are being affect like you no know, getting affected with the hpv and that hpv will lead to dysplastic changes okay let's continue guys from this slide what i want you to know see it's very clear cin1 cin2 and cin3 are there according to cn classification cin1 cin2 cin3 but according to bethesda classification the same cin1 should be considered as l cell but cin2 a cin3 should be considered as h cell according to bethesda classification this is what i want you to know following this let's see what are the predisposing factors why there are these kind of dysplastic changes happening i have already said you that the most important stimulant for the dysplastic changes is the hpv infection okay in 99.7% of the cases that this hpv is the main etiological agent causing this dysplastic changes now if a female is having intercourse early intercourse before 16 years of age now before 16 years means she is more in like you no know, this is the time of her puberty we all know that during puberty the transformation zone is more towards the outside so transformation zone more towards the outside more chances of getting like infection with the hpv or promiscuity promiscuity means having a multiple sexual partners okay how this can lead to dysplastic changes if the female is having multiple sexual partners means she might get a sexually transmitted diseases she is at a more risk of getting sexually transmitted diseases hpv infection is a sexually transmitted disease so if she gets this hpv there will be dysplastic changes or multiparity okay so if she is a multiparous woman if she is giving more and more vaginal deliveries such vaginal deliveries will bring the transformation zone more towards the outside more towards the external environment so the transformation zone is exposed more towards outside it have more risks of developing the dysplastic changes and poor socio economic status poor socio economic status means poor hygiene or poor socio economic status maybe she is a commercial sexual worker so because of the poor hygiene she is at a risk of getting this hpv infection okay poor hygiene she is not maintaining her personal hygiene so that she might get easy infection so easy infections can also predispose to the cin and smokers this is very very important that smoking is a risk factor for cin guys one important point i want to clear here see all this risk factors what i am discussing here they are risk factors both for cin as well as cervical cancer they are the risk factors for both the conditions if you have cin there is a chance that this cin can be converted into cervical cancer cin is premalignant cervical cancer is malignant keep that point in mind so smokers are at a risk of getting cin as well as cervical cancer if i am talking about cervical cancer there are two types of cervical cancer squamous cell carcinoma of cervix adenocarcinoma of cervix see smokers yes 
smokers are at risk of getting squamous cell cancer of the cervix okay now immunocompromised individuals like you know those individuals who are having hiv they are at a risk of getting this human papilloma virus and cn ocp use okay so long term ocp use more than 5 years to 8 years or more than 8 years will cause dysplastic changes like you know using these drugs will make will keep you at a risk of getting this dysplastic changes that's what i mean so ocp uses ocp usage will cause for long time use will keep you at a risk of developing adenocarcinoma of a cervix guys smokers for squamous cell carcinoma and ocp usage for adenocarcinoma of cervix and in utero exposure to diethyl silvestrol see a female is there and whenever she is a pregnant she is taking this drug which is the diethyl silvestrol now this diethyl silvestrol will cause anomalies in the developing fetus if a if the developing baby is a female just imagine that that developing baby is a female inside the uterus there is a female child and the mother is taking this diethyl silvestrol this diethyl silvestrol is going to act on the reproductive organs and cause anomalies in the reproductive organs so just imagine that one such anomaly is leading to the transformation zone more towards the outside so there are the congenital anomalies that congenital anomalies are kicking this transformation zone more towards the outside if the transformation zone is more exposed towards the outside more risk of the dysplastic changes please keep that point in mind and postpartum and puerperal sepsis postpartum what happens guys if the female is having a vaginal delivery imagine so when the vaginal delivery happens the baby is going to come out of the cervix so when the baby is passing through the cervix it is like you know bringing this transformation zone more towards the outside so it is taking out all the cervical lining first of all the thing is it's removing all the cervical lining and the baby is coming out while the baby is coming out it is bringing the transformation zone more towards the outside and the total cervical lining is lost now this whole cervical lining should be replaced so now there is so much of mitotic activity post bottom okay there is so much of my, uh, mitotic activity post bottom and the transformation zone is more towards outside so now this transformation zone is at a risk of getting infections so if there is an infection to this transformation zone there are dysplastic changes that can happen okay there is a chance that dysplastic changes can happen in the postpartum change if she is having a vaginal delivery okay so these are all the risk factors both for cn as well as cervical cancer now let's see some important points about the human papilloma virus we have seen that 99.7% of the cases that the hpv is the most common etiological agent so it's the most common etiological factor associated with the cin as well as cervical cancer so there are many strains of hpv so please concentrate that the hpv 16 is the most common but hpv 18 is the most specific hpv hpv that's causing the cervical cancer if someone ask you what is that hpv strains which are associated with cervical cancer see with cervical cancer there are two hpv 16 and 18 16 is most common human papilloma virus which is causing the cervical cancer but 18 is the most specific and most malignant hpv okay most malignant as well as most specific causing cervical cancer is hpv 18 most common is 16 but there are also other strains of hpv which are at high risk like you know they are high risk hpv which can cause a cervical cancer but from your patho basics please remember that like you know hpv 6 and hpv 11 hpv 6 and hpv 11 they are associated with what guys they are associated with the condyloma acuminata that is the genital warts 6 11 causes genital warts condyloma acuminata 16 18 causes cervical cancer 16 is the most common 18 is most malignant and most specific after seeing that let's see we have already discussed that 
HPV 16 and HPV 18, they will cause cervical cancer. Okay, we have already discussed that the cervical cancer is of two types, squamous cell carcinoma, adenocarcinoma. See, 16 is associated with the squamous cell carcinoma of the cervix and 18 is associated with the adenocarcinoma of the cervix. Okay, well and good. Now, what is the most common age group for the CIN infection? CIN infection, it is a 20 to 35 years of age or usually 20 to 30 years of age, very young age. Okay, so what is the most common age group for the the, for these dysplastic changes to happen is a 20 to 35 or 20 to 30 whatever but what about the cervical cancer see you can see cervical cancer at a two peaks what does i mean by there are two time periods in a female's life where she is at a more risk or more likely to develop the cervical cancer so what is that time period the first peak is seen at 35 to 40 years and the second peak is seen around 55 to 60 years or sometimes you know, like you know almost 60 to 70 years also okay the second peak is seen with the 55 to 60 years or sometimes they can say 65 years what i want to put into your mind is the bimodal distribution so they can ask you in the exam that which cancer shows a bimodal age distribution cervical cancer first peak in the 35 to 40 years and second peak in the 60 years of age or 65 years of age but Important point here, please concentrate that this HPV, it infects which cells? It infects the basal epithelial cells and leads to dysplastic changes. So, this the dysplastic changes, if you are seeing under the microscope, that dysplastic changes are known as coelocytes. So, what exactly are these coelocytes guys? Coelocytes are the cervical epithelial cells are the cells in the transformation zone which have undergone the dysplastic changes okay so coelocytes now after seeing this let's see some more important points about this hpv infection see this human papilloma virus it have certain proteins like l1 and l2 these proteins are helping in the adherence to the cervical epithelial cell. See, this is the cervical epithelial cell which is present in the transformation zone. Now, this is the HPV. See, this HPV uses a two proteins, L1 and L2 for the adherence. Now, what are the viral proteins helping in the replication? See, E1 and E2, these are the viral proteins which helps in the replication of a virus inside the cervical epithelial cells so e1 and e2 e1 and e2 are helping in the replication now what are the viral proteins which are helping in the malignant transformation see it is the e6 and e7 which are like you know proteins which are helping for the malignant transformation what does i mean by see e6 this protein what it will do see e6 protein inhibits the p53 gene in the epithelial cells so usually p53 is a guardian angel of the cell p53 don't let a normal cell to convert into a cancer cell but whenever p53 gene is inhibited in the cervical epithelial cells what do you expect now the cells will go crazy and they will be converted into cancer neoplastic cells and usually rb gene retinoblastoma gene will is also an anti apopt like no is how to say retinoblastoma gene is also anti-cancer gene what does i mean by it don't let the cancer to happen but if you inhibit these genes like rb gene and p53 gene now these cervical epithelial cells they will be converted into a cancer because of abnormal division so these are some important points now after seeing this let's see a few more important points about the human papilloma virus what are they just now we have seen that this human papilloma virus is associated with a pre-malignant condition that is cervical intraepithelial neoplasia and the same human papilloma virus can cause cervical cancer but please keep that point keep these points in mind human papilloma virus is also associated with the benign conditions like formation of verrucous warts or human papilloma virus 6 and 11 i have said you human papilloma virus 6 and 11 they will cause condyloma acuminata or genital warts they are associated with the giant condyloma, intraepithelial condyloma, not that important, but these are important. So, what are the pre-malignant conditions which are caused by HPV? See, cervical intraepithelial neoplasia caused by HPV. We have seen 
but not only cervical intraepithelial neoplasia but vaginal intraepithelial neoplasia vulvar intraepithelial neoplasia anal intraepithelial neoplasia and penile intraepithelial neoplasias all these intraepithelial neoplasias pre malignant conditions all of them are also caused by the hpv virus okay now malignant conditions like we have seen that cervical cancer is a malignant condition it is caused by human papilloma virus but not only squamous and adenocarcinoma of cervix carcinoma is a cancer it's a true cancer invasive see invasion means breach in the basement membrane now these cells can invade the surrounding structure so invasive squamous and adenocarcinoma of cervix we have seen but invasive squamous carcinoma of vagina invasive cancer of vulva invasive cancer of anus and invasive cancer of the penis all these can be caused by the human papilloma virus which is a very dangerous virus okay so as of now let's confine to our cervical cancer okay let's continue see these are the coelocytes what exactly are the coelocytes guys coelocytes are the dysplastic cells where the nucleic cytoplasmic ratio increases and you can see a perinuclear halo okay this is the nucleus which i am showing you right now this is the nucleus and you can see a perinuclear halo surrounding guys see this is how a normal cervical epithelial cell should look like that's a normal but here you can see the this is a now the epithelial cells are becoming something like this with a very big nucleus okay the cytoplasm was like you know totally sent to the periphery so these kind of cells are known as a coelocytes which are seen in the cervical intraepithelial neoplasia as well as with the cervical cancer okay now see here the cervical intraepithelial neoplasia you can see here like you know all these coelocytes are dysplastic cells which are present in the epithelial lining okay well and good but here like you know in can1 the coelocytes they are more localized to the lower one third okay now let's see if there is can1 can2 can3 what is the fate guys from here from this slide what i want you to know is the cervical intraepithelial neoplasia 1 see it is a pre malignant condition so what are the chances of this can1 for getting converted into a cancer that is progression to cancer progression of can to cancer how much chances usually very very less okay why because can1 is a very mild dysplasia can1 is a low grade squamous intraepithelial neoplasia uh, lesion so the chances are very very less but see can3 is a more like no more dysplastic changes will be seen here in can3 so it is having more chances for getting converted into a cancer almost 20% and you can even you can have a chances up to 40% chances of can3 getting converted into cancer okay well and good now let's continue our topic with the cervical intraepithelial neoplasia guys please remember we are what and all we are talking right now is with the cervical intraepithelial neoplasia so what is the most common age group affected we have already seen that cervical intraepithelial neoplasia 20 to 35 years but cervical cancer bimodal distribution okay so what is the screening test done for cervical intraepithelial neoplasia as well as with the cervical cancer it's a one thing that is a pap smear okay pap smear is a screening test it's not a diagnostic test it's a screening test which have almost 42 to 62 percent sensitivity. Okay, so why we are doing this test? Simple. See, we are doing this a Pap smear test to prevent the like you know conversion of the CIN to cervical cancer. What does I mean by? See, there is a female. Now she is a 25 years of age. Simple. Let me uh, give you an explanation so that the concept will become clear. See, there is a female who is of 25 years of age. I have done this Pap. test in her see if i have done this pap test i have seen abnormal dysplastic epithelial cells on the slide now i can recommend her like you know certain treatments which will prevent this dysplastic changes getting converted into cancer so this is the reason why we will do screening test pap test is a screening test done to prevent the conversions of the 
pre-malignant condition into a malignant condition. Why? Because I can prevent it. Now, what exactly is this pap test, guys? In a simple word, it's a cytological study. We are going to collect some epithelial cells from the cervix and we are going to put it on the slide and we are examining under the microscope whether the cells are normal or the whether, cells, whether the cells have undergone certain dysplastic changes. Okay, so that's what we are doing in the pap smear. See, for collecting this cells, guys, for collecting the cervical epithelial cells, we are using instrument known as IR spatula. Okay, with the help of this IR spatula, I am collecting, see, I am going to, for example, this is the cervix, this is the IR spatula. I am going to put this IR spatula onto the external cervical os and I am going to collect the epithelial cells. Okay, especially from the, I want the epithelial cells from the transformation zone. I am collecting the epithelial cells from the transformation zone and these epithelial cells are going to placed on a slide. First of all, they will be fixated and they will be placed on a slide and I am going to examine this cell. So, pap smear is a cytological study. Now, what is the time for pap smear? See, regardless of the age of intercourse, regardless, it doesn't matter when she have participated in the intercourse. It is advised that all females from 21 years of age should take this pap test. If they have any dysplastic changes, we will know that there is some dysplastic change and we can prevent that this dysplastic changes from getting converted into a cancer. So, what is the time for pap smear? Regardless of the age of first intercourse, every female is advised to take this pap test from 21 years of age. And what is the best time for pap? Okay, in a normal, like you know, uh, normal cycles, what is the best time? It's a pre-ovulatory phase or post-ovulatory phase or during menstrual phase. Which phase? See, at any time you can do the pap, but the best time is a pre-ovulatory phase. Okay, pre-ovulatory phase is the best time for collecting this epithelial cells. Okay, using a IR spatula. So, what are the instruments used guys? We have already seen that IR spatula can be used. Or you can use endocervical brush or cyto brush, which is also known as a cyto broom. Okay, see you can see here that you can use instruments like a cyto brush or cyto broom for getting this epithelial cells. Guys, important point is why we are using this cyto brush. See, especially cyto brush is used for a liquid based cytology. Okay, liquid based cytology. Incre like, you know, why we are using liquid based cytology, guys? We are using liquid based cytology to increase the sensitivity. Okay, usually what is the sensitivity of the pap test? The sensitivity of the pap test is just a 47 to 62 percent. Now, if you use this cyto brush and liquid based study, okay, if you are conducting a liquid based study, you can increase the sensitivity of the test up to 90 percent. If you are just doing a normal pap test using IR spatula and putting it under the slide and if you are like watching, then the sensitivity is less. But if you use this kind of a cyto brush or cyto broom and if you are doing a liquid based cytological study, then the sensitivity can be increased up to 90%. That's what I want to put into your mind. So, what is the fixate you use? This is the important MCQ that will be coming in your exam. That is the 95% ethyl alcohol. So, the moment you take the epithelial cells from the cervix, you are going to put it into a fixate. So, the fixate you use for the pap test is 95% ethyl alcohol. Okay. Now, so we are going to prepare two slides. Okay. And we are going to examine. So, in the pap test, we are going to prepare two slides and we are going to put it under the microscope and we are checking for any dysplastic changes present or not. Okay. Well and good. Now, what are the FIGO guidelines for the pap smear? Guys, we have already said that regardless of the age of first, first intercourse, Every female should take this pap test from 21 years itself. Now, from 21 to 29 years, this period, 21 to 29 years, for every 3 years, she should take this pap test. Once in every 3 years, she should take this pap test. Okay, well and good. Now, from 30 to 65 years of age, now in this time period, she can take, just like, you no, know, she can take a normal pap test once in every three years. There is one more choice. Either she can take this pap test. Now, the other choice is known as a co-test. What is this co-test, guys? In this co-test, in the name itself, it's there. Co-test. 
combination test two tests together you are taking a pap test as well as you are checking the presence of hpv dna what does i mean by co test it's a combination test which includes pap as well as hpv dna see if you are taking a pap smear means you should have this once in every 3 years but if you are going for this co test means you can take once in every 5 years okay if it's getting negative once in every 5 years okay that's well and good now after 65 years there is no need of pap okay no pap smear is indicated if the last 3 pap smears are negative in the last 10 years 10 years means you can have three paps or you can have two co tests am i right right like in the last 10 years 10 years you can have three paps or you can have two co tests why because co test is done once in every 5 years now if a woman is more than 65 years there is no need of any further smear if her last three pap smears are negative or her last two co tests are negative okay but what if any of the last three paps is coming a positive or i can say in the pap test i can see some dysplastic cells i should continue the screening for 75 years screening should be continued for 75 years if there is any dysplastic changes in the last three paps in any of the last three paps if you are seeing any dysplastic changes or like you know in the any like you know in co test okay if there is some problem with the co test if you find the hpv dna in co test then also you should extend the screening for the 75 years up to 75 years. this is what i want to put into your mind so at the end of the day what i want to like uh, conclude here is 21 to 29 years pap once in 3 years next 30 to 65 years this time period either you can take the pap once in every 3 years or you can go with the co test which includes pap as well as hpv dna once in every 5 years now more than 65 years no need of pap if the past 3 paps are negative or the past 2 co tests are negative but important point i want you to know here is in hiv positive patients you need to do yearly screening okay yearly pap tests are indicated if the patient is hiv positive okay now there is one more uh, a funny condition for example please concentrate that there is a woman of a 35 years okay there is a woman of 35 years if she is a 35 years either i can do pap smear or either i can do a co test now i am going with the co test okay so co test include what guys co test include both pap as well as hpv dna okay i'm just checking both a pap as well as a hpv dna now pap smear is coming something normal okay pap smear in pap smear there are no dysplastic cell uh, dysplastic cells but hpv dna is coming a positive okay it's showing that there is hpv dna in the epithelial cells of the cervix and pap smear is saying me that there are no dysplastic changes okay well and good now what i should do there is a discrepancy between the pap test as well as the hpv dna one is showing the hpv dna that there is something problem with the epithelial cells but the cytological study pap is not showing anything all the cells are normal what i should do repeat the co testing repeat repeat co testing okay after one year okay usually co testing should be done once in every 5 years but when you have these kind of discrepancies like you know pap is showing something totally different and hpv dna is something totally different now you can do the co test after a one year and after one year if you are still seeing this kind of discrepancy or if you are still seeing this kind of hpv hpv dna in the cells okay hpv dna is coming positive then you can go for the colposcopy okay repeat of the one year if you still find this hpv dna then you can go with the colposcopy don't worry we will discuss colposcopy in detail in the later part okay 
so these are some important points guys these are the figo guidelines for the pap smear okay now see i have done the pap smear okay now what if the pap smear result is abnormal i have done the pap smear and in the pap smear i can see some abnormalities what exactly is a pap smear it's a cytological study what does i mean by abnormal abnormal means i can i'm seeing that there are certain dysplastic cells which are present so now what i should do now i should go with the biopsy okay i should go with the biopsy based on a pap smear i shouldn't do the treatment why because pap smear is a screening test i should go with the biopsy which is more confirmatory so now if i can see a lesion okay directly if i can see a lesion on the cervix directly take the punch biopsy like no taken part of the biopsy what if the lesion is not visible now if i can see a lesion in a resource rich area what does i mean by resource rich area in a urban population in a urban area in a city see i can go with the colposcopy what does it mean by colposcopy colposcopy means like you know it's a magnification device okay i'm going to magnify the cervix and i will take a biopsy from that area where there are dysplastic cells we will discuss colposcopy in detail don't worry now what if the lesion is not visible and i am there in a resource poor area see in a resource poor area means in a rural population a rural a population or in a rural area in a rural setting see if i can't see a lesion then i will do via or willy what exactly are this via and willy via and willy are visual inspection studies via means visual inspection visual inspection under acetic acid and willy means visual inspection under lugol's iodine okay so don't worry i will make the concept clear see i have done the pap smear general routine examination in a normal 22 year old or 25 year old or 28 year old doesn't matter she came for a normal examination routine screening i ask her now you should have to take a pap why because this is like you know it's a figo indication that usually a female of 21 to 29 years you should regularly take a pap once in 3 years i have asked her recently have you take the pap in the last 3 years she said no now i ask her better take a pap now she is taking the pap now after doing this pap i am seeing some abnormal cells now i will say her there are some dysplastic cells in your cervix it's better to take a biopsy now she said okay she gave a consent okay you can take now if the lesion is visible what i will do i will take see in this condition i can see a lesion over here if the lesion is directly visible to the naked eye you can take a punch biopsy and you can examine what if the lesion is not visible if the lesion is not visible what you should do you have to find out the dysplastic cells to find out the dysplastic cells you are using a magnification device known as a colposcope so with a colposcope you are magnifying the cervix to almost 30 times after magnification you are going to put some chemicals or you are going to use i will directly say you are going to put acetic acid on to the cervix see usually dysplastic cells appears white see this is cervix i am keeping some acetic acid over here now i am magnifying now if there are any dysplastic cells which are not seen with the naked eye but with the colposcope after keeping this acetic acid i can see the dysplastic cells which are appearing white in color now i am going to take a biopsy from there if a lesion is not visible i will be using colposcopy now this colposcopy is a very uh, how to say like a more uh, more of uh, present in the like you know in, in urban areas not in the rural areas it's a, a very costly machine now what i should do in a rural area i have already said you i will be doing via and willy what exactly are this via and willy whenever there is no colposcope you should identify the dysplastic cells with your naked eye how is this possible how means see this is the cervix imagine that this is the cervix now again i am going to put the acetic acid over here i have said acetic after up, upon keeping acetic acid on to the cervix 
the dysplastic cells will take aceto white color the dysplastic cells are going to convert into a more whitish in color that is the aceto white appearance or i can use willi what does it mean by willi visual inspection under lugal's iodine i am going to put lugal's iodine onto the cervix normally see in a in a normal cervical epithelial cell normally glycogen is present so glycogen will take up this lugal's iodine and appears brown in color but in a dysplastic cells and neoplastic cells the glycogen stores are rapidly utilized so dysplastic cells are deprived of glycogen so they won't take up this lugal's iodine so what i am saying guys normal normal epithelial cells will take up the lugal's iodine and appears brown or mahogany in color brownish mahogany in color normal epithelial cells but the dysplastic cells when you put lugal's iodine onto them they don't take up this color so they will more looks yellowish don't worry i will show you the gross images okay so lesion visible punch biopsy lesion not visible in an urban setting go with the colposcopy in a in a rural setting if the lesion is not visible you have to do the visual inspection by acetic acid and lugal's iodine now please concentrate here see what exactly is this via see via means visual inspection of the cervix with the 5% acetic acid so if you put this 5% acetic acid you can see you can clearly see here this area which is more white in color so this is the area of uh, dysplastic cells so what i'm going to do i'm going to take a biopsy from this area see what is willi willi means visual inspection under lugal's iodine normal cells appear brown or mahogany in color but the dysplastic cells which are deprived of glycogen they will appear unstained or yellow in color see both of them are from a single female same female see this is the area of dysplastic cells they are appearing more yellowish in color okay sir well and good now what to do see these are more images i am just showing you to make the concepts clear see this is something normal this cervix is something normal see there are no estro white areas here and uh, the whole cervix is more brownish in color okay but see this is the condition of a low grade squamous intraepithelial neoplasia which is which is lc low grade squamous intraepithelial lesion not neoplasia or cin1 okay see you can see some aceto white areas some aceto white areas after keeping 5% acetic acid okay but here see upon keeping the lugal iodine you can see this brown uh, this yellow colored unstained areas normal cervix is looking brownish or mahogany well and good now see this is hcl where you are seeing the aceto white areas aceto white areas with lugal iodine you can see this yellow color areas okay so these are all for making the concepts more clear you can see after putting 5% acetic acid you can see a aceto white area here okay you can see a aceto white area here all this is the aceto white appearance because of the dysplastic cells okay aceto white areas aceto white areas okay now let's now what are the different management strategies with different different pap smear results for example if the pap smear result is absolutely normal a 25 year old female came to my clinic and now she is having a pap smear test now whenever she is having a pap smear test the result came absolutely normal there are no dysplastic cells in her cervix if the result is normal then continue the pap smear as per the acvog according to acvog guidelines just continue the pap smear or according to a figo guideline just continue the pap smear just like you no know, once in every 3 years okay when i got now what if she is having ascus in her pap smear result ascus means see there are atypical cells okay atypical squamous cells of unknown significance see there are some atypical cells are there see this is not a cin1 this is not cin2 
are not CIN3. There are some atypical cells. See, for to call it as a CIN1, the dysplastic cells should occupy the lower one third, but they are not having this thing. These are atypical cells. We don't know, like, you know, what is the significance of them. Now, what I should do? If I am having this kind of ascus, repeat the pap after 6 months or I can repeat the pap in the next year. If the report shows still after 1 year or 6 months, okay, I am just doing the follow. -up. If still the report shows increased ascus, the number of atypical cells are getting increased, then what I should do? I should do the colposcopic biopsy. Okay, I should do the BAPS, you know, not just taking the cells. I have to take up a chunk of a tissue and I should do the examination, okay, of that tissue. Now, what if the PAPSMA result is showing a atypical squamous cells, where atypical squamous cells are there, where the histology, like, you know, our histopathological examination cannot exclude the HCL. What does I mean by, see, I have done the PAP. There are atypical cells. After like you know atypical cells, I have taken a biopsy and I am doing a histopathological examination now. Now I have done the histopathological examination, but still I cannot rule out the H cell or I cannot rule out a, a pre-malignant condition. Now what I should do? Now again I have to go for the colposcopy and endocervical curatage. Colposcopy along with the endocervical curatage. See. If I am having atypical cells and I am having atypical cells, now what I have done, I have done the histopathological study. I have like you know examined them. But still I can't rule out this H cell. Then what I should do? I should go with the colposcopy and endocervical curatage. Okay, well and good. Now if I am getting agus, what does I mean by agus? Atypical glandular cells. See, these are glandular cells, atypical glandular cells of unknown significance. We all know that there are endometrial glands. So, if I am having this kind of agus, this female is at a risk of developing endometrial cancer and cervical cancer. Okay. Now, what I should do now? Now, as she is at a risk of getting endometrial cancer and cervical cancer, now I should do endometrial biopsy. Along with the endometrial biopsy, I should also do colposcopy and endocervical curatage. Okay. So, endometrial biopsy is to rule out the endometrial cancer. Colposcopy and endocervical curatage are to rule out the cervical cancer. Okay. But from here, these are the very, very important points which we are going to discuss right now. If pap smear result is normal, what you should do? Just normal. Repeat. Repeat the pap smear according to FIGO guidelines. From here, see, if the pap smear result is showing CAN1, for me, pap smear result is showing CAN1. What does I mean by? Dysplastic cells are present in the lower one third, okay, of the epithelial lining. Now, what I should do? Now, I shouldn't treat, I have already said, I shouldn't treat a female based on a pap smear. I have to confirm this with a more confirmatory test and with a biopsy. What is that? I have to go with the colposcopy. Okay, see, LCL or CAN1 is a, of a more mild dysplastic changes. So, either I can, I, it's up to me. I can do endocervical curatage or like a plus or minus. But you should do a colposcopy. Guys, listen. Why we will do colposcopy? Colposcope is a magnification instrument for the localization of the dysplastic cells. When we will use colposcope? We will only use colposcope when I can't see a lesion. Then I am taking the assistance of this colposcope. If I can see a lesion, if a lesion is visible, then do the punch biopsy. In the same way, HCL. HCL is according to Bethesda classification. In CAN classification, CAN2, CAN3 and carcinoma in situ, all of them are HCL according to Bethesda. Okay, well and good. Now, what I should do here? Here also, do colposcopy and endocervical curatage also. Do colposcopy. Here, here it is not like plus or minus. Do colposcopy along with endocervical curatage. But if you can see a lesion, you can directly take a punch biopsy. Okay? Something like that. See, why we are doing endocervical curatage? Endocervical curatage, like you know, endocervix is the site, most common site for the adenocarcinoma to develop. So, we are, that is the reason why we are taking the endocervical curatages also. 
okay i have said see the most common site the most common site for the cin or cervical cancer is the transformation zone that's okay but if i am talking in specific about adenocarcinoma adenocarcinoma arises from endo cervix we will discuss when we are like you know discussing the cervical cancer we haven't gone to the cervical cancer yet still we are in the cervical intraepithelial neoplasia and its management strategies see lsil do colposcope plus or minus endo cervical curettage if the lesion is visible do the punch biopsy see if you are seeing hsl high grade squamous intraepithelial lesion do colposcopy along with that do endo cervical curettage if you can directly say we uh, see a lesion do the punch biopsy okay well and good now what these are the special conditions something like you know you are seeing else low grade squamous intraepithelial lesion during a pregnancy pregnancy she is a pregnant female now in this pregnant female it's coming else the pap test is coming else or i can say cin1 what i should do should i have to do a further investigation here no no investigation should be done till delivery okay you have to wait investigations like you no know, whatever we want to do a colposcopic biopsy or whatever do it 6 weeks after the delivery okay you have to wait 6 weeks postpartum and do the further investigation but during pregnancy don't try to do any examination what if there is a hcl okay lcl no investigation hcl is more dangerous condition which includes a cin3 and carcinoma in situ now in this condition what you should do okay go with the colposcopic biopsy okay with the colposcope take a biopsy if the lesion is visible lesion visible do the punch biopsy that's anyway you're going to do so this is the pap smear report different pap smear reports and different management strategies which you are going to do okay well and good now let's see some important points about the colposcopy see i have said this colposcope which you are seeing here is a magnification device so it can magnify up to 20 or even sometimes some colposcopes can magnify up to 30 times okay so what is the like you know use of this colposcope you are going to magnify the cervix like you know before magnifying you have to put the like you know acetic acid you have to put you have to apply 5% acetic acid onto the cervix now you have to magnify now when you are magnifying if there if there is any dysplastic cells means if there is any dysplastic area means that area will appear aceto white we have already seen this see gold standard this colposcopy is a gold standard for evaluation of abnormal cervical pathology okay so it's a gold standard for knowing the cytology of the cervix for abnormal cervical cytology what is the gold standard guys it is the colposcopy that is the reason why see in all these conditions see you are doing the colposcope colposcope colposcopy 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 okay so here also colposcopy see to examine the cervical cytology what is the gold standard it's the colposcopy okay what is the disadvantage the main disadvantage of this colposcopy is the upper two thirds of the endo cervix is not visualized okay colposcopy what it is doing it is the magnifying the cervix it is magnifying the cervix how can you see something inside the cervix you can't see that right so colposcopy cannot document the endo cervix okay now let's see what exactly is this cone biopsy cone biopsy is done to confirm the findings of colposcopy what does i mean by see what what you are doing is you are, you have done the pap test initially pap test it's a screening test to confirm pap you are doing a colposcopy more diagnostic now why we are doing this cone biopsy guys this cone biopsy is done it's a more confirmatory something like that see there is any discrepancy between pap and colposcopy then you have to have a more confirmatory test that is the cone biopsy what does i mean by see pap is saying something abnormal but colposcopy is saying something normal or pap uh, how to say like uh, try to understand something like this there is a discrepancy pap results are not coinciding with the colposcopic results then you have to go with the cone biopsy or if you are having unsatisfactory colposcopy 
unsatisfactory colposcopy means you are not satisfied you are not able to see the transformation zone or you you can't localize the dysplastic cells in such conditions you should have to go with the you have to go with the cone biopsy what exactly is this cone biopsy cone biopsy means removing a cervix like you know removing lower part of the cervix in the form of a cone okay in the form of a cone you are taking a chunk of the cervix in the form of a cone and what you are going to do with that you are going to do the examination this is a biopsy you are going to you are getting more part of a tissue so you will be knowing there is any dysplastic or neoplastic changes important is what they will ask you what are the indications of a cone biopsy when you are going to do a cone biopsy so these are all the indications see suspecting adenocarcinoma guys what is the disadvantage of colposcopy colposcopy cannot see or with the colposcope you cannot see endocervix from endocervix i have said you will be having adenocarcinoma so if you are suspecting adenocarcinoma you have to do the a cone biopsy if endocervical keratage is coming positive see you have done the colposcopy along with the endocervical keratage if endocervical keratage is coming positive what does it mean by endocervix is having the dysplastic changes it means that there is a chance of adenocarcinoma so you have to go with the cone biopsy why because again i am repeating colposcope cannot visualize the endocervix okay now if there is any discrepancy in pap smear result and colposcopy this we have, we have already seen this okay so pap smear is saying that there is some abnormality or there is dysplastic cells and colposcopy is saying colposcopic biopsy i mean colposcopy is something normal if there is a discrepancy for more confirmatory results do the cone biopsy if you can't localize the squamocolumnar junction this is unsatisfactory actually you have to localize the squamocolumnar junction and that's the place where you have to take a biopsy after putting this acetic acid now if you can't localize the squamocolumnar junction or uh, while you are doing colposcopy go with the cone biopsy if you are suspecting invasive carcinoma okay you are suspecting the cancer then go with the a cone biopsy okay you are suspecting like there is a breach in the basement membrane zone you should have to have a more chunk of a tissue then here you are taking a cone biopsy okay invasive carcinoma is suspected based on colposcopy and the cytological study cytological study is a pap smear colposcopy you, you have done the biopsy now you are suspecting that what if there is a spread of this cancer by like you know what if there is a breach in the basement membrane zone and there is a spread of this dysplastic cells to the surrounding so in that condition you can go with the cone biopsy or okay so these are the indications now what are the complications of this cone biopsy do you think this is good see if you are taking if you are removing some part of the cervix you can expect definitely you can expect a bleeding and this part can get infection remember so in this part you can expect a so much of inflammatory changes and this part can undergo stenosis okay so cervical stenosis are please keep this point in your mind guys during pregnancy the cervix should be close it should be tight enough but if you are removing so much stroma of the cervix it will become loose so during pregnancy it can simply dilate so that can cause cervical incompetence so what are the complications of this cone biopsy bleeding infection cervical stenosis and cervical incompetence so this cervical incompetence can lead to second trimester second trimester abortions okay second trimester recurrent abortions okay why because every time in the second trimester okay this cervix is getting dilated why because you have removed some part of the tissue it's not strong enough to hold the like no baby so it's simply dilating now see this cone biopsy it's not only a diagnostic see first you have done the pap you have done the colposcopy for more confirmatory results you are doing the cone biopsy see so cone biopsy is a diagnostic okay well and good but the same cone biopsy removing some part of cervix is also therapeutic in certain conditions the same cone biopsy is therapeutic for stage 1a1 of cervical cancer so how you are going to treat 
cervical cancer stage 1a1 again when we are doing the cervical cancer treatment we will discuss there stage 1a1 of cervical cancer you can use cone biopsy as a treatment option okay okay well and good see cone biopsy is not a treatment for cervical intraepithelial neoplasia don't say something like that to confirm the results of pap and colposcopy we are doing the cone biopsy okay now so how you are going to manage the cervical intraepithelial neoplasia the management see you can do a prevention of like you know the cervical intraepithelial neoplasia or you can do the definitive management first let's see the preventive measures okay there is no cervical intraepithelial neoplasia you don't want to have a cervical intraepithelial neoplasia you have to take a vaccines so what are the vaccines available bivalent vaccine quadrivalent vaccine and nine valent vaccine which is the best vaccine see what exactly is this bivalent vaccine see bivalent vaccine will give protection against 16 and 18 what are the 16 and 18 hpv 16 and hpv 18 bivalent vaccine gives protection against 16 and 18 the name of the vaccine is cervarix and you have to take a three shots 0 1 6 months means like you know how to say like you know the day you have taken after one month and after six months you have to take the vaccines 0 1 6 3 shots quadrivalent vaccine quadrivalent means quadra quadra means four or quad means four it gives protection against 6 and 11 we all know that 6 and 11 causes condyloma acuminata genital warts 16 and 18 causes cervical cancer 16 causes squamous cell carcinoma of cervix 18 causes adenocarcinoma of the cervix so what is the vaccine vaccine is a gardasil okay so gardasil three shots 0 to 6 months okay three shots you have to take on 0 that's like you no know, first time you are taking after two months after six months you have to take now the nine valent vaccine it gives protein protection again is the nine different strains of uh, high risk hpvs so this also you have to take on 0 to 6 months okay well and good so in this vaccine you can use an adjuvant so adjuvant used in hpv vaccine is mcqs these are all the mcqs so what exactly is an adjuvant guys adjuvant is a more immunogenic it boosts up the vaccine okay it, it boosts up the effectiveness of the vaccine so mixing aluminum sulfate mixing aluminum sulfate in this vaccine makes the vaccine more effective kind of thing so in a simple way i can say something like that okay so what is the adjuvant used guys it's the aluminum sulfate so what is the ideal age for the vaccine administration when a, a boy or a girl should take this usually 11 to 12 years is the ideal age but you can take the range can be between 9 to 26 years can a boy take hpv vaccine because boy is not having a cervical like you know cervix so he cannot have cervical intraepithelial neoplasia cervical cancer should a boy take uh, like you know hpv vaccines yes yes why not because hpv is associated with the genital warts both in male and female and I also have said hpv is associated with many malignant and premalignant conditions HPV is associated with the cervical intraepithelial neoplasia of anus. So HPV is associated with the cervical intraepithelial neoplasia of penis. Even boys can get affected with the HPV. That's so damn true. Okay. Now, so what is the most common complication? See, after taking vaccine, not only HPV vaccine, any vaccine, the most common complication is a fainting or syncope in the adolescents. Okay. So in, in among adolescents. after taking a vaccine the most common complication you can expect is a fainting or syncope sudden loss of trans, uh, consciousness okay well and good sir so i have taken a vaccine should i have to continue my screening okay so like uh, i got my vaccination done like you know when i am of 15 years of age now should i have to have pap smear like a uh, pap smear like you know regular testing every once in 3 years absolutely yes screening should be continued even after vaccination that's very very important okay vaccination like you no know, doesn't matter if right? she have taken the vaccination or not from 21 years every 3 years she should have to take the pap test okay well and good so what are the definitive treatments preventive measures we have seen they are the vaccines definitive measures include lots and lots of uh, surgeries as well as the ablative methods what are they ablative methods include cryo surgery or laser ablation cryo surgery means you know by using the cool color, cool gases we are going to destroy the dysplastic cells so ablative methods include cryo surgery laser ablation or surgical procedures include loop 
excision of a transformation zone we are taking out the transformation zone okay large loop excision of the transformation zone which is known as ellets or leap which is a very very important like you know uh, surgery for the exams loop electro excisional procedures okay leap not loop i am saying loop sorry it's a leap okay loop electro excisional procedures can be done or you can do coniization or you can do the hysterectomy guys what i am trying to say see there are preventive measures vaccines or we can have a, a definitive treatments for the cain now you can ask me so we are having so many a definitive treatments for example if i am having cain 1 what kind of treat definitive treatment you are going to give to me if i am having cain 2 what we should do if a patient is having cain 3 what we can do see that we will be discussing in this slide okay so please concentrate that's usually cain 1 for the conversion of cain 1 into cain3 this is not a treatment just in general i am saying cain1 it takes almost 5 years of time for getting converted to cain3 and if you are having cain3 right now it might take almost 10 years for getting converted into cervical cancer see not all cain3 will be converted into cervical cancer only all, all, like you know almost a 20 to 30% chance or maximum 40% chance is there that cain3 will be converted into cervical cancer but not all cain3 will be converted into cervical cancer if at all it's converting it takes almost 10 years okay okay well and good see usually cain1 if a female is having cain1 how i have to treat her see do observational yearly hpv every year just do the follow up okay yearly hpv do it and yearly pap test you can do it okay yearly pap or yearly hpv you can do it simple follow up for cain1 not much just follow okay every uh, 6 to 12 months or every yearly you can do it not much why because cain1 most of the time normally regresses within 2 years even if you don't treat any like you know even if you don't treat it will simply regress by itself within 2 years now what if cain1 is not getting regressed like you know you are doing the follow up for the next 2 years still it is showing cain1 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 what you have to do you have to go with the ablative methods you have to go with the ablative methods like a laser ablation or cryotherapy this is very very important okay so persisting cain1 with the cain persist more than 2 years what's the management what's the definitive treatment it's the cryotherapy or cryo surgery okay well and good so if i am if a female is having cain2 cain3 how we are going to manage what is the definitive treatment it is a leap loop electro surgical excision procedure leap should be done for both cain2 and cain3 now what if there is a recurring cain3 okay you have done but again if you are when you are doing follow up again you are seeing the cain3 dysplastic changes then what you have to do do the hysterectomy okay so for recurring cain3 you can go with the hysterectomy and now the laser ablation okay the ablative procedures laser ablation is best if cain cervical intraepithelial neoplasia is extending to the vaginal fornices if the cain like you know if you are like uh, getting a report that vaginal fornices are being fornices just fornices vaginal fornices are being affected with this cervical intraepithelial cells or you can if you are seeing this dysplastic changes in the vaginal fornices then you have to go with the laser ablation very simple cain1 simply follow up. if the cain1 is persisting more than 2 years do the cryo surgery for cain2 cain3 what you have to do guys you have to do the leap for recurring cain3 hysterectomy and if the if you are if you are seeing that this cain is extending to the vaginal fornices then the best would be laser ablation okay guys now here you can see like you know this is a cervix which have this uh, isito white areas indicating that there is cin cervical intraepithelial neoplasia and in this condition it is cin3 and upon putting this lugal iodine you can see this yellow color area okay he, like you know these are the cervix of two same patients okay so this is also cin3 okay i am saying okay you can't know whether it's cin1 or cin2 just by like you know looking just like that i am saying this is cin3 so for cin3 what is the treatment option guys the treatment option is loop electrosurgical excision procedure so that's being done over here 
okay so this is after the surgery this is after the surgery we have removed okay like you know by uh, electro like you know electro surgically we have done the excision of that part of cervix which have the dysplastic cells so this is after the surgery okay after the surgery like you know i have uh, put the i have kept the like aceto like you know that acetic acid not i in the sense here uh, like you know acetic acid is kept over here but can you see the dysplastic cells over here there are no dysplastic cells okay everything is getting normal over here even after keeping that like you know uh, lugal's iodine see everything all the cervical area is looking a brownish in color it means that dysplastic cells have gone the dysplastic cells have gone everything become normal so cn2 cn3 it is a leap now see what you what you can see here is this is the electrosurgical loop okay you are trying to remove this part of cervix which have the dysplastic cells okay for getting a more clear idea i just want you to look at this uh, video where the loop electrosurgical excision procedure is happening see the surgeon is removing that part of a cervix which have the dysplastic cells okay please concentrate okay that part was removed which is having the dysplastic cells now he is coagulating the edges okay guys so far we have discussed the cervical intraepithelial neoplasia and its a treatment managements okay so in the next video we will be discussing in detail about the cervical cancer hope the lecture is helpful thank you Welcome back students. In the previous video, we have discussed about a pre-malignant condition that is cervical intraepithelial neoplasia. Now in this video, let's discuss about cervical cancer. Now let's start from the basics. Cervical cancer is the most common gynecological cancer in the world and also in Indian women. Please note this point. Cervical cancer is the most common gynecological cancer or genital cancer. in the world and also in the indian women but if someone ask you what is the most common cancer in the women in world see this is the order of cancers worldwide the most common cancer is a breast cancer followed by colorectal lung and cervical cancer so i can say cervical cancer is the fourth most common cancer in women among the world but if i am talking about the genital cancers then cervical cancer will be in the first place so please try to understand that cervical cancer is the most common genital or gynecological cancer but not overall overall breast cancer is the most common cancer now what is the most common cancer of women in india if i am talking about specific in india then the answer will be again breast cancer okay here also most common cancer of women in india is again breast cancer now fourth most common cancer in women worldwide i have said you most common cancer among women worldwide is breast fourth most common is cervical cancer okay most common cause of dash in indian women cervical cancer is the most common cause of post menopausal bleeding okay so please note this point cervical cancer it's not only the most common gynecological cancer but the same cervical cancer is the most common cause of post menopausal bleeding in indian women and it is also the most common cause of pyometra okay so please note these two important points it's the most common cause of post menopausal bleeding as well as the pyometra what is the most common histological variant see in the previous video i have said that the cervical cancer you can have two different types of cervical cancers most common being squamous cell carcinoma of the cervix okay so most common histological variant is squamous cell carcinoma of the cervix and adenocarcinoma can also exist but what is the most common site of adenocarcinoma the most common site of adenocarcinoma is 
end of cervix okay so these are all one liner kind of things which you need to keep in your mind okay having said that let's see some important risk factors guys i don't want to go in detail about all these risk factors again why because we have already discussed all these risk factors in the previous video itself okay see these risk factors which i am showing you right now they are not only the risk factors for the cervical cancer but they are also the predisposing factors for the cervical intraepithelial neoplasia so there we have discussed in detail about all these risk factors now i am skipping this part now what are the symptoms if the woman is having a cervical cancer what kind of symptoms does she have she will be having a bleeding per vaginum or irregular bleeding irregular vaginal bleeding is the most common cause if she is having cervical cancer means then she will be having abnormal vaginal bleeding but what is the most specific the most specific symptom is post coital bleeding guys this is the very very important mcq post coital bleeding you have to think about cervical cancer but here itself i want to take a bit more time post coital bleeding is the most specific symptom of the cervical cancer okay there is no doubt but you also have to think about the differential diagnosis that is post coital bleeding can also be seen in the conditions of cervical polyps it can also be seen with the uterine prolapse see the moment there is a uterine prolapse because of the congestion of the region of the cervix there can be a decubitus ulcer and that decubitus ulcer can bleed and give rise to pain so cervical polyps uterine polyps if there is cervicitis because of gonorrheal infection ectropia on during pregnancy i have said there will be outward projection of the endocervix that 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 is known as ectropia okay so even with ectropia a female can have a post coital bleeding and during menopause guys during menopause what happens there is decrease in the levels of estrogens and that cause vaginal atrophy and that can lead to post coital bleeding so these are all the differential diagnosis for the post coital bleeding at the end of the day what i want you to remember most common symptom is abnormal vaginal bleeding that is irregular vaginal bleeding is the most common thing and most specific is the post coital bleeding now you can expect a offensive vaginal discharge there can be a deep pelvic pain but once the disease is completely established you can have a four cardinal signs this is important mcq what are the four cardinal signs which can be seen with the cervical cancer it is hardness friability fixated and bleeds on touch see this cervical cancer like you know if you are trying to do vaginal examination and when you are touching this cervix it easily bleeds on touch why because it is easily friable it is so delicate kind of thing when you are trying to do the examination it bleeds and it is a fixated and you can see hardness also so what you have to remember are these four cardinal signs fixated hardness friability bleeds on touch most specific is post coital bleeding most common is irregular vaginal bleeding okay continue with the complications what kind of complications a female will have if she is having cervical cancer the mnemonic which i used to remember is fund f u n d having cervical cancer can lead to formation of abnormal connection between the cavities that is fistula formation so what kind of fistulas you can expect in a female who is having the cervical cancer vesico vaginal fistulas means an abnormal connection between urinary bladder and vagina see this is a cancer right it is expanding when it is expanding it is going to cause pressure on the surrounding regions that pressure can decrease the blood supply to the surrounding regions and that decrease in blood supply will cause ischemia necrosis of the surrounding tissues so because of this necrosis there can be an abnormal connection between the body cavities cancer spreading shows pressure on the surrounding regions that pressure mechanical pressure will cause the necrosis of the surrounding regions 
that will cause abnormal cavity or abnormal connection between the body cavities. So, cervical cancer can cause fistula formation. What kind of fistulas? Vesicovaginal fistulas or vesicocervical fistula or rectovaginal fistulas can also be possible. So, these are the complications. Now, see this cervical cancer, it can metastasize and it can involve the parametrium ureters, kidneys. So, that can kidney involvement can cause nephrosis and uremia. And also please remember that this renal failure, kidney involvement in cervical cancer, renal failure with the uremia is the most common cause of death. If someone asks you what is the most common cause of death in a patient with cervical cancer, it's the kidney involvement, uremia, okay. So, U for uremia, N for nephrosis, that is hydronephrosis or you can expect a pyonephrosis and that can lead to death. These are the complications of a cervical cancer. Now, what is the management of the cervical cancer? See, the management depends on the stage of the cervical cancer. Guys, from this slide, it is utmost important. If they are asking you a question from cervical cancer, that would be definitely from the management stages. Okay. So, what is the cervical cancer management? First important point. See, this slide is totally about the rules of the game. Okay. All these are the rules on which we are going to do the management or on which we will play the game of the management of cervical cancer. See, what are the rules? Radiotherapy can be used in all the stages of cervical cancer. For all stages of cervical cancer, stage 1, 2, 3, 4, you can do the radiotherapy. Radiotherapy is good. Okay. But when we are discussing in detail about stage wise management, we will see from where exactly you are starting the radiotherapy. Okay. But it can be done for any stage. So, if you are trying to do the radiotherapy, you should give a radio sensitizer so that there will be more receptivity of this radiation. So, what is a radio sensitizer used in the cancer cervix is cisplatin. Okay, this is the MCQ. Cisplatin is the radio sensitizer. Now, see if the tumor size is more than 2 centimeters. If the cervical cancer size is more than 2 centimeters, don't even think about trying to conserve the fertility of the patient. Usually, See, the management of cervical cancer depends on whether the female is desiring of future fertility or not. See, the rule, see, we are not discussing the, like, you know, the exact management. These are all the rules. We will discuss the management in detail. Again, I am repeating. Don't worry. If the tumor size is more than 2 centimeters, don't think about conserving the fertility of the patient. But, if the size is greater than 4 cm means don't even think about surgery as an option. See, if the size of the cancer is more than 4 cm means don't think about surgery, don't plan for the surgery. If the size is greater than 2 cm means don't try to conserve the fertility. Now, see the stage and the treatment. Here also Please guys, this is a general idea. Okay. For example, if the stage is present between 1 to 2A1, you don't know what exactly is 1, stage 1, and you don't know what exactly is 2A1. Don't worry. I'm just saying generally. If the stage is between 1 to 2A1, you can go with the radical hysterectomy. You can do radical hysterectomy. If the stage is between 1B3 and stage 4, you can do a chemo radiation. Okay, well and good. Guys, some important MCQ points which you have to keep in mind are, see, the staging, how we are going to do the staging in cervical cancer. See, all cancers in gynae are staged surgically except, except cervical cancer. All gynecological cancers in gynae are staged surgically means, first of all, we will do the surgery. We will remove the tissues. We will see whether there is extension or not based on that we are going to do the staging in all the other cancers. Like you know endometrial cancer, uterine cancer, vaginal cancer, whatever. All cancers are staged surgically, not the cervical cancer. But now these days, this is important, this is the new addition. 
but uh, like you know uh, we are doing the clinical staging but now surgical staging and radiological evaluation surgical and radiological evaluation are also a part of assigning the stage initially what we are doing we are just doing the clinical staging clinical staging include physical examination biopsy and different types of like ct pet that and all now along with the clinical staging you also have to consider the radiological and surgical evaluation also to assign the stage of cervical cancer okay well and good out of all the radiological evaluation pet scan is more useful now what we have seen in this slide guys radiotherapy can be used for all the stages of cancer radiotherapy is good okay the radio sensitizer is cisplatin if the cancer size if the cancer size is greater than 2 cm don't try to conserve the fertility of the patient if the tumor size is greater than 4 cm don't even think about the surgery if the cancer stage is between 1 and 2a1 you can do the radical hysterectomy this is a general thing but not in specific if the stage is between 1b3 and stage 4 you can do chemo radiation okay but from now please be more attentive we are going to assigning the stage of the cervical cancer which is very very important now let's see the staging of the cervical cancer see stage 1 very simple in stage 1 the cancer the cancer is strictly confined to the cervix means the cancer is nowhere only in the cervix now in this stage 1 we are having a and b these are the substages see 1a in 1a the cancer is a very very small you can only diagnose this cancer by microscopy it's a very it's such a small cancer you can only see this cancer via microscopically now see the depth of invasion is less than 5 millimeter okay now less than 5 millimeters means is it less than 2 centimeters 2 millimeters 3 millimeters or 4 millimeters based on that the 1a was further divided into 1a1 1a2 see it's a microscopic cancer only but see if the depth of invasion is less than 3 millimeters it is 1a1 if the depth of invasion is more than 3 millimeters but less than 5 millimeters means it is 1a2 so 1a 1a the depth of invasion is less than 5 millimeters 1a1 less than 3 1a2 more than 3 millimeters but less than 5 millimeters okay well and good now what about 1b now 1b means the depth of invasion is more the cancer is invading more than 5 millimeters that's what i mean by so the depth of invasion is greater than 5 millimeters but still the cancer is only localized to the cervix because it's a stage one in stage one the cervix the cervical cancer is strictly confined to the cervix itself it's nowhere going it's not going to vagina it's not going to parametrium it's not going to pelvic side wall and there is no distant metastasis okay now the 1b was further divided into 1b1 1b2 and 1b3 see in 1b1 the depth of invasion is greater than 5 millimeter okay but in addition to that the size the size of the tumor is less than 2 cm okay in the greatest dimension the cancer size is less than 2 cm but it, it is invading more than 5 millimeters in depth into stroma so stromal invasion is greater than 5 millimeters but the tumor size is less than 2 centimeters that's what i mean by stage 1b1 now 1b2 means now see invasive carcinoma the size the size of the cancer is now getting more than 2 centimeters but it is less than 4 centimeters more than 2 less than 4 now from here see 1b2 1b2 what is that important point 1b2 now the cancer size is getting more than 2 centimeters what is that important point you have to keep in mind guys once if the cancer size is greater than 2 centimeters don't even think about the fertility don't try to do a surgery which preserves her fertility for the future that's what i have said okay again we will discuss don't worry 
Now one b three. The cancer size is greater than four centimeter in the greatest dimension. More big size. Now once if it crosses more than four centimeters, it means don't even think about the surgery at all. Okay, we are not doing the surgeries. Okay, that's not helpful. Doing a surgery is not of much beneficial use. Okay, so stage one is completed. Now stage two. What are the important points about the stage two? Now cancer is spreading to the vagina. This is what happening in the stage two. Carcinoma invades beyond the uterus, beyond the uterus, but not extending onto the lower one third of the vagina or to the pelvic wall. What does I mean by? See, here there is spreading of the cancer, but where not it is spreading? It's not spreading to lower one third of the vagina or to the pelvic wall. It's not spreading to lower one third of the vagina or it's not spreading to the pelvic wall, but it is spreading to upper two thirds of the vagina. This is important. Okay, so please concentrate, guys. In two a, in two a, please concentrate. Involvement is limited to the upper two thirds of the vagina without parametrium being involved. There is no parametrial involvement, but the upper two third of the vagina is getting involved. Stage one, cervix only. Okay, the cancer is localized only to the cervix. Here, I want to say one important point. Please concentrate in the top. See, the extension of cancer to the uterus doesn't determine the staging. Okay, so the uterine involvement doesn't have any significance. Please keep this point in mind. Now let's come back. Two A, the cancer is spreading to the upper two third of the vagina without the parametrial involvement. But here, a very very important point. Please concentrate in one A one. Okay, two like sorry, not one A one, two A one. See, two A was further divided into two A one and two A two. The cancer size is less than four centimeters in dimension. You can ask me, sir. In one B three, you have said that the cancer size is greater than four centimeters, and now in two A one, you are saying that the cancer size is less than four centimeters. How can this be possible, guys? The staging depends on the involvement. What does I mean by? It doesn't matter whatever is the size. Once if the upper two third vagina is involved, it is stage two. That's it. If once the upper two third of the vagina is getting involved, the stage one will be converted into stage two. Size is not important. Size of the tumor is not the criteria here. Upper two third of the vagina involvement, we are coming into stage two. Now, here in stage two, we will see what is the size of the tumor. If the size of the tumor is Less than four centimeters, it is one a one. If the size of the tumor is greater than four centimeters, it is two a two. Okay. Again, I am repeating. We are only considering whether the upper two third of the vagina is involved or not. If it is involved, we are into second stage. Okay. Now, if the tumor size is less than four centimeters, means two a one. More than four centimeters means two a two. Now, what is To be, guys. To be, what is that important point? Only upper two third of the vagina is involved, involved, but no parametrium. But here in to be, along with the upper two third of the vaginal involvement, parametrium is also getting involved. Parametrial involvement, but still the cancer is not reaching to the pelvic side walls. Okay, still the cancer is localized to vagina, and parametrium is now being involved in the stage to be. Let's move forward, guys. Here, please also remember: Can we consider a fertility sparing surgery for stage two A two? Don't even think about it. Why? Because if the tumor size is greater than two centimeters, no fertility sparing surgery. Now, at least, can I consider a surgery as an option for stage two A two? Don't even think about that. If the tumor size Is greater than four centimeters. We are not going to do the surgery. Now, what about stage two A one? In stage two A one, if a female is having a cervical cancer of stage two A one, shall I have to consider a fertility sparing surgery? See, here the cancer size is less than four centimeters. Now, less than four centimeters means it can also be less than two centimeters. If it is less than two centimeters. 
I will be considering a fertility sparing surgery. If it is more than 2 cm means no I won't do. But can I consider surgery as a treatment option for stage 2A1? I can do. Why? Because here the size of the tumor is less than 4 cm. So I can consider surgery as a treatment option. Now let's see stage 3 and stage 4. Guys in stage 1 cancer only to the cervix. Uterine involvement doesn't determine the staging of the cervical cancer. In stage 2 cancer is getting spreading from the cervix to the upper two third of the vagina with the parametrial involvement also but no pelvic side wall involvement. Now in stage 3 this is what important is happening. Now pelvic side walls okay pelvic the cancer is extending to the pelvic side wall as well as the lower the lower one third of the vagina is getting involved lower one third of the vagina and pelvic side walls are getting involved see when the cancer is spreading from please concentrate here this is the cervix imagine that this is the cervix and the top you are going to have the uterus something like this simple here is the pelvic side wall okay these are the pelvic side walls Surrounding is the parametrium. You will be having the broad ligament and all that. That region is known as the parametrium. What and all I am showing you here is the uterus, is the cervix and is the pelvic side walls. Now when the cancer is spreading from the cervix to the pelvic side walls, definitely the structures which are present in between will be definitely affected. We know that in the parametrium there is a ureter passing so definitely in stage 3 the ureters are being involved. So when the ureters are being involved you can expect hydronephrosis in the patient. Okay. So kidney is not involved. So there is no distant metastasis to kidney. There is no direct extension to the kidneys. But you can expect hydronephrosis even in the stage 3. Why? Because when the cancer is spreading from the cervix to the pelvic side walls in the parametrium. The ureters are there and these ureters will be like you know uh, compressed that will cause hydronephrosis. Okay well and good. See there is hydronephrosis or non-functioning non-functioning kidney. Why? Because whenever there is hydronephrosis that increases the pressure inside the kidneys that decreases the GFR. So that can be a non-functional non kidney. Okay well and good. And even in the same stage 3. Para, aortic and pelvic lymph nodes are also involved. So what are all the important points you need to keep in mind regarding stage 3? Lower one third of the vagina is involved. Pelvic side walls are getting involved. Hydronephrosis and non-functional kidney, kidney can be there. And also lymph nodal involvement. Which lymph nodes guys? Pelvic and para aortic lymph nodes are getting involved. Now let's see the substages in the stage 3. See 3 was divided into 3A, 3B and 3C. Now 3C was further divided into C1 and C2. This is a new classification which is very very important. Now let's start from 3A, 3B, 3C. In 3A, only the lower one third of the vagina is involved. Okay, out of all, all the things which are present in 3, out of all the things which are present in stage 3, what are all the things? I have said, lower one third of the vagina, pelvic side wall involvement, hydronephrosis, pelvic and parabiotic lymph nodes. Out of all, lower one third of the Vaginal involvement is there, but there is no extension to the pelvic side wall. If once the pelvic side walls are getting involved, the staging will be 3B. Okay, see extension to pelvic wall. Once the pelvic wall is involvement, definitely the ureters will be affected. So there is hydronephrosis and non-functioning kidney. 3A. Lower one third of the vagina. 3B. Pelvic side walls, hydronephrosis, non-functioning kidney. Now 3C. Now 3C, the lymph nodes are getting involved. Which lymph nodes? If it is, if it is pelvic lymph nodes, then it is 3C1. If it is only pelvic lymph nodes, it is 3C1. If paraiotic lymph nodes are getting involved, means it is 3C2. The moment paraiotic lymph nodes are involved, it is 3C2. If it is only pelvic lymph nodes, it is 3C1. So third stage is also completed. Now fourth stage is very very easy. Now in stage 4, 
the cancer is spreading to the distant organs distant metastasis is now seen in stage 4 if it is only to the adjacent organs bowel bladder rectum and all if it is spreading to the adjacent pelvic organs it is 4a if it is the to the distant organs like lungs liver then it is 4b spread to distant organs is 4b but to the surrounding organs adjacent organs it is 4a so this is in detail staging about the cervical cancer i know i am repeating but if you can get a question definitely that question will be from the staging and management stage 1 only cervical involvement stage 2 vaginal involvement that is the upper two third of the vaginal involvement with the parametrial involvement stage 3 lower one third of the vaginal involvement pelvic side wall involvement hydronephrosis hydrouretous non functioning kidneys stage 4 okay stage 3 pelvic and parietic lymphodes are also affected and stage 4 distant metastasis okay metastasis to adjacent organs or even to the distant organs like lungs now let's see the treatment based on the staging okay so what is the management of cervical cancer please be attentive that if it is stage 1a1 1a1 stage 1 that to stage 1a1 see in stage 1a1 it is very clear that the cancer's involvement the stromal invasion stromal invasion is less than 3 millimeters so how can you say that in stage 1a1 the stromal involvement is less than 3 millimeters let me prove you please concentrate here in stage 1a1 the stromal involvement is less than 3 millimeters that's what if it is stage 1a1 if the female family is not completed she is desiring of future pregnancy then what is the management if her family is completed means what is the management the management is absolutely different based on the fertility like you know future desiring for the fertility now please concentrate guys here in 1a1 i just want to add a few more points it is 3 millimeter stromal invasion only but if there is no lymphovascular space invasion means lvsi lymphovascular space means like you no know, like you know the lymphatics and the blood vessels if they are not involved means it's very good then if she is willing to have a pregnancy means you can just do the coniization in the topic of cervical intraepithelial neoplasia i have said that the coniization or cone biopsy is a diagnostic but it can also be used for the therapeutic use see stage 1a1 it's a microcarcinoma microinvasive carcinoma for treating stage 1a1 you can use the cone biopsy that's what i am doing here coniization can be done but once if the lymphovascular space invasion is there means still it is less than 3 millimeters still it is microscopic cancer stage 1a1 but if the lymphovascular spaces are involved means you can do the radical tracheolectomy what does it mean by radical tracheolectomy radical tracheolectomy means removing only the cervix okay removing the cervix with the parametrial tissues cervix is removed parametrial tissues are removed then what we will be doing will be connecting the uterus with the vagina uterus and vagina will be stitched they are connected the cervix we have removed so that's what is radical tracheolectomy is that fertility sparing surgery radical tracheolectomy is a fertility sparing surgery very very important mcq that's the reason why we are doing it in a female who wants to have a future pregnancy what if the family is completed if her family is completed do the hysterectomy extrafacial hysterectomy if there is no lymphovascular space invasion but if there is also lymphovascular space invasion along with hysterectomy also do lymphadenectomy okay along with the radical hysterectomy do pelvic lymphadenectomy also why because the lymphovascular space is involved okay well and good now what is the treatment for stage 1a2 1a2 means the invasion is more than 3 millimeters but it is less than 5 millimeters how can you say sir see 
in 1A2, 1A2, the cancer involvement, the cancer invasion into the stroma, into the cervical stroma is greater than 3 millimeters but less than 5 millimeters. Now what we have to do sir, if it is stage 2A2, if the family is not completed means do the radical trachelectomy or you can also consider coniization but usually we won't do coniization but that can also be considered. Do radical trachelectomy because it's a fertility sparing surgery. If the family is completed, no issues at all, simply do the modified radical hysterectomy, class 2 modified radical hysterectomy. Don't worry, we are having a complete different video on different types of hysterectomy. Okay, different types of hysterectomy that we will discuss in a different video. Now see, it is class 2 modified radical hysterectomy is the treatment that we are going to do, is the surgery that we are going to do for the stage 2A2 in a female who is not willing to have a future pregnancy. Okay, well and good. Stage 1B1, see here. The stroman involvement is more than 5 millimeters. More than 5 millimeters of the stroma is involved. But the cancer size is less than 2 centimeters. Now, if the, here the cancer size is less than 2 centimeters. Now, what we can do? We can do a radical trachelectomy. Why we are doing radical trachelectomy guys here? Because, see here in this condition of stage 1B1, the cancer size is less than 2 centimeters. If the cancer size is less than 2 centimeters, you can conserve her fertility. You can spare her fertility. Okay. That is the reason why in a female who have not completed her family, you are doing radical trachelectomy. I have already said to you, radical trachelectomy is a kind of procedure which preserves her fertility. Now, family completed, not an issue at all. Do class 3 radical hysterectomy. See guys, stage 1A1, extrafacial hysterectomy. Stage 1A2, class 2 modified radical hysterectomy. Stage 1B1, class 3 radical hysterectomy. Now from here, everything is going to be downhill. Everything is going to be very easy from now. Why? Because, see, stage 1B2, in 1B2, the cancer size is greater than 2 centimeters. The size of the cancer is more than 2 centimeters. But it is less than 4 centimeters. If the cancer size is more than 2 centimeters, means don't even think about fertility sparing. So, do radical hysterectomy. The cancer size is more. Oh, now it's very, it's getting more complicated. So, remove her uterus. Class 3 radical hysterectomy. And in a female who is not desiring pregnancy, there also class 3 radical hysterectomy. Here also radical, uh, class 3 radical hysterectomy. And in this place also class 3 radical hysterectomy. 1B3, 1B3, what is the important point here? See in 1B3, the cancer size is getting more than 4 centimeters. If it is more than 4 centimeters, now what we have to do? Don't even think about the surgery as an option. So we are not doing any hysterectomies here. Hysterectomy is a surgical procedure. So we are not doing surgeries. So we are doing a chemo radiation here as well as chemo radiation here in both the patients. Now, this is a very, very important point and my favorite point. That is stage 2A1. In stage 2A1, see we are coming to stage 2. Stage 2 means the upper two-third of the vagina is getting involved. Okay, the upper two-third of the vagina. Now here, what about the size of the like, you know, cancer? It doesn't matter whatever is the size. The upper two-third of the vagina is involved, it's 2. Now, we, let's see here. See. 2A1, in 2A1, the size of the cancer, the size of the cancer is less than 4 centimeters. The size of the cancer is less than 4 centimeters. What does I mean by? If it is less than 4 centimeters, it may be less than 3, it may be less than 2 or it may be even less than 1. It doesn't matter about the size. Upper two-third of the vagina is involved, it is 2. Now let's see. If it is less than 4 centimeters, means it can be less than 2 centimeters also. If it is less than 2 centimeters, I can do fertility sparing surgery. So, I can do radical trachelectomy here. This is the important point. If the size of the cancer is greater than 2 centimeters means, if it is greater than 2 centimeters, again I will be going for the class 3 radical hysterectomy. Because still it is less than 4 centimeters. 
I can consider the surgery. So, class 3 radical hysterectomy. If the family is completed, not an issue at all. Very simple. Class 3 radical hysterectomy. Now, stage 2A2. Now, in stage 2A2, what's happening? Please concentrate in 2A2. Again, the cancer size is getting more than 4 cm in the greatest dimension. More than 4 cm means there is no chance for us. More than 4 cm, the only option we are left with is chemo radiation. So, from here, from here, for all the next upcoming stages, we are not going to consider the surgery. What we are going to do is the chemo radiation. As I have said earlier, that radiation can be given in all the stages of CA cervix. Okay. So, it is more than 4 cm. Do chemo radiation here? Also here. So, this is the management. So, this is the management for the CA cervix. Okay. Now, the one important point I just want to add here. See, in all these conditions, in all these conditions, you should also have to do the lymphadenectomy. Okay. Pelvic lymphadenectomy should also be considered in all these stages. Okay. Like, you know, wherever you are doing the surgery, that's what I mean by. So, wherever you are doing the hysterectomy surgeries, there along with the hysterectomy surgeries, you also have to do the pelvic lymphadenectomy. That's what the important point. Please keep that point in mind. I have said radical trachelectomy is fertility sparing surgery. What we are doing here guys? We are removing the cervix. We are joining the uterus with the vagina. Now, when it should be considered? It should only be considered to preserve the pregnancy or to preserve the future fertility if the tumor size is less than 2 cm. I have discussed. Now, she is not having the cervix. In this condition, she can't go for a normal vaginal delivery. Now, a female who have undergone post-trachelectomy, who have undergone the trachelectomy, now in her, what is the mode of delivery? It's a C-section. Very, very important. So, what is radical trachelectomy, guys? We are removing the cervix and along with that surrounding parametrium and even upper part of the vagina will be removed. Okay, well and good. Now, see, we have seen the surgical management. Now, let's see the radiotherapy. See, radiotherapy can be given where two ways. We can give it by external beam. From the external, external beam radiotherapy can be given. And we can also consider brachytherapy. External beam radiotherapy or you can consider brachytherapy. So, it's a radiotherapy, right? We have to expose the female for the to the radiation. So, what are the radiation sources? In external beam radiotherapy, we are using cesium as a source for the radiation. And in brachytherapy, we are using iridium as a source of radiation. So, what exactly is this brachytherapy? Brachytherapy means we are going to put the source of radiation into the body cavities. Don't worry, I will show you. Means we are taking the radiation into the body cavities and exposing those neoplastic cells to this radiation so that they will be destroyed. Now, where exactly we will give this brachytherapy? Brachytherapy, like you know, we are concentrating this radiation on two certain particular points. For example, there is a point known as a point A. There is an area known as a point A. See, that's the area where paracervical lymph nodes are present. See, these paracervical lymph nodes are considered to be the first lymph nodes which are getting affected in cancer cervix. They are the first lymph nodes. They are the, not the most common lymph nodes. They are the first lymph nodes which will be affected in the CA cervix. So, what we will do here? We are going to concentrate the radiation on to this point A in brachytherapy. So, where exactly this point A is located guys? Point A is located... 2 centimeters above the external cervical loss. See, this is the external cervical loss. See, from the external cervical loss, 2 centimeters above and 2 centimeters lateral. 2 centimeters lateral from the external cervical loss and 2 centimeters above the external cervical loss. That's the point where we are having the paracervical lymph nodes. So, on that point, we are going to concentrate the radiation. Okay, so we are going to give a radiation of almost 80 to 90 gray. That's the intracavitary brachytherapy. What does it mean by I am going to see? I am going to take the radiation source. This is the radiation source. We are going to take the radiation source into the body and I am going to 
particularly concentrate on that point okay now please concentrate in this video okay what exactly is happening is you know i am taking the radiation source into the body see this radiation source like you know right, right now it's in the like you know uterus see and now it is emitting the radiation and this radiation will kill the neoplastic cells that the point a okay so this is all about the brachytherapy now after seeing what is brachytherapy now let's see some more important miscellaneous points from a ca cervix so this slide is totally about the different types of hysterectomy that we have already done in the other video now what is the lymphatic supply of the cervix this is something normal 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 this is something anatomical cervix is draining into hope lymph nodes what does it mean by hope lymph nodes see hypogastric obturator paracervical and external iliac lymph nodes are the lymph nodes which are getting the lymphatic drainage from cervix our cervix is draining into these lymph nodes the mnemonic is hope hypogastric obturator paracervical and external iliac okay well and good now let's see some more important points what is the root of spread how this cancer cervix is metastasizing to different different organs the root can be a direct extinction lymphatic or hematogenous root why any of these roots it can metastasize to a different organ or to a surrounding area now out of all this what is the most common root of spread it is direct extinction okay now what is the most common lymph node which is affected in ca cervix guys please remember there is a lot of controversy over this area it used to be said that obturator lymph nodes are the most common lymph nodes which are affected in ca cervix okay i have said it many times but the recent data is showing that external iliac lymph nodes are more commonly getting affected in ca cervix than the obturator lymph nodes okay this is a new recent data please keep this point in mind external lymph nodes external iliac lymph nodes are the most common lymph nodes that are being affected in ca cervix okay what is the most common site of hematogenous spread guys see we have seen direct extinction lymphatic root hematogenous root if it is a hematogenous root what is the most common site it is lungs okay so lungs are the most common site of hemat lungs are, lungs are the most common site for the hematogenous spread now what is the least common site for the metastasis the least common site for the metastasis is ovaries there is nowhere we have discussed that the cervical cancer is now extending to the ovaries so ovaries are usually spared okay so now when you are doing when you are doing a hysterectomy procedure in a young patient okay you have to do hysterectomy in a young patient now you can have an option to preserve her ovaries because ovaries are the least common sites for the metastasis so ovaries can be spared if you are doing hysterectomy in a young patient right because ovaries are the least common sites for the metastasis okay and most common site for the hematogenous spread is lungs and least common site that is the direct extension least common site for the direct extension is the ovaries okay so all these are the important points again i am saying that please concentrate on the staging and management options for different different stages okay i hope the lecture is helpful thank you Welcome back students now in this session of gynecological oncology we will be discussing about endometrial cancer or uterine cancer first of all this uterine cancer or endometrial cancer in india is rare endometrial cancer is the most common gynecological cancer in the western world or developed countries and that too this endometrial cancer is going to be most commonly seen in a post menopausal women of usually 50 to 60 years of age okay this is not going to be seen usually 
in a reproductive age group but this is a cancer of old women okay having said that let's start from the basics guys endometrial cancer it's a cancer but what about the pre malignant condition okay that is endometrial hyperplasia what exactly is this endometrial hyperplasia guys very simple in the name itself it's very clear that endometrial hyperproliferation endometrial hyperplasia which means that the endometrium is hyperproliferating now if you ask me in in specific that which endometrium is hyperproliferating it's a stromal it's it's not the stroma it's a glands okay the endometrial glands are hyperproliferating in comparison to the stroma so more and more division of the endometrial glands now this endometrial hyperplasia is classified into two types it's a very old classification but still we have to know this the classification is simple hyperplasia and complex hyperplasia so what exactly is the difference guys very simple that simple hyperplasia it's a very simple thing okay there is proliferation of the glands endometrial glands but not too much but in complex hyperplasia the endometrial glands are too much crowded okay there is a too much crowding of the endometrial glands and there is a back to back arrangement of this endometrial glands and even you can see that there is a luminal outpouching okay there is luminal outpouching of this endometrial glands but there is no such kind of crowding in simple hyperplasia now let me ask you which is good simple hyperplasia is good or complex hyperplasia is good in comparison in relatively the simple hyperplasia is somewhat good then complex hyperplasia why because complex is more complicated kind of thing there is more number of glands now having said that the simple and complex hyperplasias are further divided into four types based on presence of atypical cells guys please concentrate here see this is simple and complex hyperplasias they are further classified into four types how sir simple hyperplasia without atypia what does i mean by without atypia in the sense that there are no atypical cells and simple hyperplasia with atypical cells simple atypical hyperplasia and simple hyperplasia without atypia in the same way complex hyperplasias are also divided into complex hyperplasia with atypical cells and complex hyperplasias without atypical cells so in total we are having four categories see this is the old classification but these days this old classification was totally kept into trash now we are having a new classification or new categorization what is that see now you are not considering hyperplasia into simple and complex types now it's very simple that hyperplasia with atypical cells or without atypical cells it's very clear straight forward hyperplasia without atypia something good and hyperplasia with atypical cells that is atypical hyperplasia so we are having only two types now point to be remembered is atypical hyperplasias okay atypical hyperplasias which means the hyperplasia which are having the atypical cells okay what exactly are these atypical cells guys you know it atypical cells means there is a very large nucleus inside a cell okay if this is a cell there is a very large nucleus occupying the cell and sending the cytoplasm to the periphery or i can say there is increase nucleus to cytoplasm ratio so these are termed as atypical cells now if you are having hyperplasia with atypical cells that can be called as endometrial intraepithelial neoplasm okay endometrial intraepithelial neoplasm is nothing but atypical hyperplasia it doesn't matter whether it is a simple hyperplasia or complex hyperplasia okay having said that let's continue further now see we are having four different types of hyperplasias okay this is a old classification it trash now but still it is important because they are asking the questions in the exam what are they these four different types of hyperplasias they may change into carcinomas okay they may transform into cancers how much sir if you ask me that see simple without atypia 
simple hyperplasia without atpm which means it's a simple hyperplasia there are no atypical cells which means very very good so there is only 1% chance of turning into cancer so what about the extreme end that is complex with atypia see already the hyperplasia is complex that too atypical cells are present which means very bad so there is lots and lots of chances that this hyperplasia with atypical cells may transform into cancer so almost 30 percent chance so it's very simple guys simple hyperplasias have very much less chance complex hyperplasias have more chance now if i am talking about the simple hyperplasias simples without atypical cells only one percent chance simple with atypical cells simple with atypical cells that is eight percent chance complex more chance of turning into cancer okay but even in complex there are two types complex without atypical cells and complex with atypical cells complex without atypical cells means something good so how much only three percent chance of turning into cancer complex with atypical cells is very bad so 30 percent chance why i am repeating so many times because this is the place where examiner are going to ask the question one 3, 8, 29 percent. 1, 3, 8, 29. You should buy heart it at any cost. Okay. Having said that, now let's continue with the investigation of endometrial hyperplasia. So, before going into investigation, how a patient or how a female going to present to your clinic? How means? See, as there is endometrial hyperplasia, whenever this endometrium, too much amount of endometrium, whenever it is getting shedding out, what happens there is too much amount of shedding that causes too much amount of bleeding so how a female is going to present to your clinic guys with too much amount of vaginal bleeding so that's the complaint she is going to present to you now if she is saying such kind of complaint too much amount of vaginal bleeding then what you will be doing so you are thinking that this might be an endometrial hyperplasia so what you will be doing is a transvaginal sonography now, if you are doing this transvaginal sonography, what you may see? See, if there is, if there is endometrial hyperplasia, that is more and more endometrium. So, you can see that there will be endometrial thickness. There is increase in the endometrial thickness. So, the ET thick, ET, that endometrial thickness, if it is more than 12 mm in a premenopausal woman or more than 5 mm in a postmenopausal woman. See what you have done, it's very simple. You have done the transvaginal sonography. In the transvaginal sonography, if in a premenopausal woman, if the endometrial thickness is more than 12 mm, or in a postmenopausal woman, more than 5 mm. Why? Because usually in a postmenopausal woman, there will be vaginal atrophy or there will be atrophy of the urogenital system. So, usually in a postmenopausal woman, there will be atrophy of the endometrium, which will be less than 4 mm, which will be less than 4 mm, I am repeating. But if in a postmenopausal woman, if she is having more than 5 mm thickness of the endometrium, now what we have to do? We have done TVS first. In the TVS, we are having the results more than 12 mm in the premenopausal woman and more than 5 mm in the postmenopausal woman. Now, what we have to do? We are getting information that there is thickened endometrium. From the transvaginal sonographic studies, we came to know that there is thickened endometrium. Now, what I have to do? I have to take out this endometrium and I have to send it to the path lab. So, for that, I will be using an instrument known as PIPIL and taking the biopsy. So, that is known as PIPIL biopsy. So, endometrial aspiration biopsy with the help of an instrument known as PIPIL. So, this is something good. I am going to send it to the path lab. But important point is, see, it's better to do a fractional curettage than a people biopsy, simple people biopsy. Why, sir? See, with the people biopsy, what you are going to have is a scrape of endometrium, mostly from the anterior wall. Okay, this is the people. I will be taking the endometrial sampling from the anterior wall. What if there is hyperplasia, which is in the posterior wall, or what if already cancer is present in the lateral walls? Or in the fundus so to have a better result what I will be doing is I will be doing a fractional curettage so fractional curettage is a gold standard okay so people biopsy I can do but more result oriented or like you know more specific 
is a fractional curettage, I will be taking the endometrial sampling from the anterior wall, posterior wall, lateral walls and fundus, endocervix, isthmus and all the stuff. Okay, so entire, all the fractions of the uterus, I am going to take a biopsy. After that, what I will be doing, I will be sending you to the path lab to examine how the cells are and what is the status of the cells. Now, better than this, see, I have done the TVS. After that, I am going to take the biopsy. I can do it with the people or I can do it with the fractional curettage. Better than the fractional curettage, I can have one more option, which is known as the hysteroscopic biopsy. Okay, hysteroscopic biopsy. What exactly is this hysteroscopic biopsy, sir? See, you just want to take a biopsy. It would be better if you have a vision inside the uterine cavity. Okay, if I am doing the fractional curettage, I don't know what is the, like, no, what's happening inside the uterine cavity. I, I cannot have a visual documentation. But with the hysteroscope, with the hysteroscope, if I am taking biopsy means, that's more better. Or I can say there is 100% sensitivity will be present with the hysteroscopic biopsy. I'm just going to put a probe with a camera into the uterine cavity and I'm viewing the whole uterine cavity. If I find that there is some abnormal area, I'm going to take the biopsy, especially from that particular area so that I can have a better result. So 100% sensitivity and will be there for the hysteroscopic biopsy. So this is what I will be doing to this female. Now, important point to be noted is, see, if you are not finding this fractional curettage in the options, what is the gold standard for endometrial biopsy? Okay, gold standard investigation. Fractional curettage, we all know. But if you don't find this answer, fractional curettage, then you can go for the dilation and curettage. Okay, dilation and curettage, one of the same. Now, let's go further. Okay guys, in the path lab, the result came. Now, the result can be something like this. Absolutely normal. If, if it is absolutely normal, there is no problem at all. What if the result is saying me that there is hyperplasia, but there is no atypia. Okay, there is hyperplasia. It doesn't matter whether it's a simple hyperplasia or complex hyperplasia. My treatment is not going to be depend on whether it is simple hyperplasia or complex hyperplasia. My treatment or my management is going to be depend on whether they are atypical cells or not. Now the result came. Now the result is showing that there is hypoplasia without atypical cells, which means something good. There are no atypical cells. If there are no atypical cells, the risk of turning into cancer is very, very less. Okay. 1 to 3 percent. If it is simple, 1 percent. If it is complex, 3 percent. Okay, 1 to 3 percent chances of transformation into malignancy are there. Now, what I will be doing? In this condition, I will be asking the female whoever come to me to take the progesterone. So, I am going to keep her on the progesterone therapy. How progesterones are going to help in this condition? Progesterones will cause decidualization in the uterine endometrium. Estrogens will cause proliferation, hyperproliferation. But progesterone's action on the endometrium will cause the stabilization of the endometrium or decidualization of the endometrium. And we will also know that progesterone can cause atrophy of the endometrium. That's what we want here. Okay. So that's the reason why in non-atypical hyperplasias, I can use progesterone therapy and that progesterone therapy can be given cyclically. Okay. That progesterone therapy can be given cyclically or that progesterone therapy can be given continuously. So continuously in the sense, continuously in the sense, I will be keeping an progesterone releasing IUCD, intrauterine contraceptive device that continuously releases this progesterone. That progesterone will bring the decidualization in the uterine endometrium and stabilizes the endometrium from hyperproliferating. Okay. See. In a premenopausal woman, okay, a premenop if, if this hypoplasia without atypia is seen in a premenopausal woman, what I will be doing is mostly I will be giving her medroxyprogesterone acetate, which is nothing but a progesterone. Okay, medroxyprogesterone acetate for 21 days for the next three months, or I can use continuous progesterone by giving her or keeping an intrauterine contraceptive device. Okay, progesterone releasing Mirena. Or in a perimenopausal woman, in a perimenopausal woman, I'm not going to use this for 21 days. I'm not going to give her medroxyprogesterone acetate for 21 days, but I will be giving medroxyprogesterone acetate, same thing, for 14 days. Okay, 5 to 10 milligram. I'm decreasing the dose. Okay, why? Because she's almost perimenopausal. So here I will be using the same medroxyprogesterone acetate for 
14 days okay 5 to 10 milligram each month okay that's the management of endometrial hypoplasia without atp now what if the result is such that there is endometrial hypoplasia but atp are atypical cells are present now if i am saying the atypical cells are present there is a heavy risk there, there is a high risk of transforming to malignancy how much is guys it's almost 8 to 29 percent or 30 percent chances of turning into malignancy so how i am going to manage this condition now i will be managing it mainly by hysterectomy okay i will be managing it by total abdominal hysterectomy but before doing hysterectomy before doing hysterectomy you make sure that she is not having the some focal masses of already cancer okay some focal masses of cancer is already present so rule out the cancer first see the result is hyperplasia with atypical cells hyperplasia with atypical cells see these atypical cells are also present in cancer okay the atypical cells are even present in the cancer now if you are having this atypical cells both in cancer and hyperplasia so you should rule out that there is no cancer at this moment okay so to rule out that what you should do you should perform again you should perform a fractional curettage okay if, if the endometrial biopsy okay if the endometrial biopsy is showing atypical cells just wait now let me make the concept more clear you have done the transvaginal sonography you have done the transvaginal sonography after that instead of doing a fractional curettage you might have done a pipil biopsy okay you have done the tvs you have done the pipil biopsy now in the pipil biopsy now the result is showing that there is atypical hyperplasia now what you should do you should perform a hysterectomy but before performing hysterectomy what i am saying is first rule out the cancer why because the atypical cells are present in hyperplasias that that is atypical hyperplasias as well as the cancer so to rule out the malignancy what you should do perform perform fractional curettage under hysteroscopy under hysteroscopic guidance do a fractional curettage and if in the fractional curettage if it's showing that there is no endometrial cancer okay why because how we will say that there is endometrial cancer if there is a stromal invasion okay in endometrial cancer there will be stromal invasion if there is no such invasion we can conformly say that this is just atypical hyperplasia and what i will be doing is a hysterectomy okay why we are doing hysterectomy why? because there is more risk of turning into cancer okay so that's what you have to keep in mind guys performing hysterectomy along with hysterectomy what you can do is also bilateral salpingo oophorectomy see please concentrate here if the female is less than 45 years if the female is less than 45 years we are not going to do bilateral salpingo hysterectomy so bso is not indicated if the female is less than 45 years but if she is more than 45 years means bilateral salpingo oophorectomy can be done okay so it's based on the age now what if there is this endometrial cancer okay or not endometrial cancer what if there is this atypical hyperplasia which is having a more risk of turning into malignancy that too this is happening in a female who haven't completed her family now what's the treatment option for atypical hyperplasia guys that atypical hyperplasia the treatment option is hysteroscopy not hysteroscopy sorry hysterectomy now what if there is no family completion in a young female a young female with atypical hyperplasia her family is not completed if you perform hysterectomy that she will not going to have a future child now in, th in this condition see in a premenopausal woman who is a desiring of fertility which means her family is not completed now in this case we can give her high dose progesterone or magistrol high dose progesterone therapy called as magistrol should be given after explaining her after explaining her the risk of progression to cancer why because she is having atypical hyperplasias okay so this is what i want to keep into your mind non atypical hyperplasias progesterone therapy atypical hyperplasias hysterectomy okay hysterectomy so this is what you should know about endometrial hyperplasia so once we have completed the endometrial hyperplasia now let's move to endometrial cancer guys i have already said you that endometrial cancer in india is very very rare entity and this is the most common is the most common gynecological cancer in the developed countries
okay or the western world incidence is almost 20 percent and the mean age of presentation this is something very very important usually this endometrial cancer as i have already said that this is going to be present somewhere between 50 to 70 years so the mean will be coming somewhere around 60 years okay usually the endometrial cancer is going to present between 50 to 70 years of age okay this is not a cancer of reproductive age this is the cancer of postmenopausal age now having said that let me also tell you some important single line of questions okay see sir most common gynecological cancer in the western world is endometrial cancer but in india and the old wide okay worldwide what's the most common gynecological cancer or genital cancer it is a cervical cancer and even in india it is a cervical cancer okay don't forget this point now so let me tell you one more important point about this endometrial cancer see these endometrial cancers are highly associated with hyper estrogenic state why sir hyper estrogenic state means more estrogens more estrogens are going to be the stimulation okay are going to be the stimulate are going to show the stimulatory effect on the endometrium so too much amount of stimulation on this endometrium can cause endometrial cancer okay please keep that point in mind so what are the risk factors so all that factors which increase the estrogen levels in the body can act as a risk factor now see obesity okay obesity is a risk factor why because if a female is obese guys risk factors are very very important okay definitely they will ask you all of the following are the risk factors for endometrial cancer except so you should know all the risk factors very clearly obesity is a risk factor why See, if a female is obese means she is having lots and lots of fat on her body. She is having lots of adipose tissue. We all know that the androgens in a female body are getting peripherally aromatized to estrogens in the adipose tissue. If she is having more fat means more peripheral aromatization. So, more androgens are getting converted into estrogens. So, estrogens means like if there are more estrogens means that causes more stimulation. More stimulation may any time takes to endometrial cancer and late menopause usually for example let's take a menopause should be happening by 50 years for example if she is having menopause at 57 years it means that she is having a seven extra years of endometrial stimulation by the estrogen so seven extra years means that's something bad the, the endometrium is keep on getting stimulated so such stimulation can turn into malignancy or early menarch okay early menarch what does it mean by early menarch early menarch means usually a female should have her like you know menarch by the age of 13 for example 13 not 30 13 okay if she is having this menarch started up starting of this menses by uh, something like eight years of age eight years of age means almost five extra years of stimulation okay this five eight nine ten Okay, 11, 12, 13, that 5 to 6 extra years of the endometrial stimulation will be there and that may cause a cancer in her later life. Okay, now diabetes, usually diabetes women are like, you know, a bit obese women and they are more likely to get this endometrial cancer and atypical endometrial hypoplasias, I have already said you, atypical hypoplasias having a risk of how much percent guys? If it is simple hypoplasia, 8%. If it is complex hyperplasia with atypia, it is 30%, 29 to 30%. So, atypical hyperplasias are more likely to turn into malignancy. And the conditions wherever there is unopposed estrogens are the conditions like anovulatory conditions. For example, PCOD. We all know that in PCOD, there is high levels of estrogen, but there are no progesterones. So, estrogenic effect should be counteracted by the progesterone. But what? In this PCOD is happening. In the PCOD, there is hyperestrogenemia, but there is no progesterone. Why? Because there is no ovulation. If there is no ovulation, there is no corpus luteal formation. If there is no corpus luteum, there is no progesterone. So here there is decreased progesterone, hyperestrogenemia. And HRT, we all know that hormone replacement therapy. What we are giving? We are replacing the estrogens. Okay. A female uh, after, like you know her menopause after her menopause she will be having all the post menopausal symptoms like flushing like vaginal atrophy that can cause post coital bleeding so she is having lots of problems like osteoporosis and all guys it's very clear in a post menopausal woman there will be flushing there will be osteoporosis there will be dyspareunia and all the stuff so what i will be doing i will be 
trying to give the hormone replacement therapy. I am trying to replace the lost estrogens into her body. I am replacing this estrogens back into her body. So this extra estrogens what I am going to pump into her body that can cause a stimulation of this endometrium and that can lead to cancer. Okay. And nulliparity. See, if, 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 if she is a nulliparous female or if she is an infertile female, she is not having pregnancy. If she is not having pregnancy means she is not having a break of that 9 months. Having pregnancy means 9 months break of menstrual periods or menstrual cycles. And almost a 6 months break because of the lactation. Lactational amenorrhea will be there. Almost one and a half year break will be there. If she is having a pregnancy, almost one and a half year break will be there for her from the menstrual cycles. But if what if she is a nulliparous female? If she is a nulliparous female, there is no such break, continuous endometrial stimulation every month by the estrogens. So that is a risk factor. And what about this a tamoxifen therapy? See, tamoxifen is what kind of drug, guys? Tamoxifen is a serum, selective estrogen receptor modulator. See, this tamoxifen it is having anti-estrogenic effects on the breast. It is anti-estrogenic. Okay anti estrogenic on the breast but it is highly estrogenic but it is highly estrogenic on the endometrium okay so now there is a female who is having breast cancer now the surgeon is keeping her on this tamoxifen therapy okay the physician or whatever they are giving her this tamoxifen therapy now if she is on this tamoxifen therapy that is good for her breast why right? because this tamoxifen is acting as an anti-estrogen but at the same time this high tamoxifen which is estrogenic on her endometrium can stimulate her endometrium and can cause endometrial cancer. That is the reason why, that is the reason why if the female is getting started on her tamoxifen therapy prophylactically they will do the hysterectomy because Taking tamoxifen increases the risk of uterine cancer or endometrial cancer. So prophylactically before itself, if, if she is, if she have completed her family, then they will remove the uh, uterus. Okay. Now I have already explained the, about the infertility. If she is having infertility means there is a no break from the menstrual cycles. Senile endometritis. Senile endometritis. Senile endometritis means in a postmenopausal woman or a female who is getting old, there will be atrophy of this endometrium. Whenever there is atrophy of this endometrium, whenever these kind of inflammatory changes going on this endometrium, such inflammatory changes can cause neoplastic changes also. Okay, that can lead to dysplasia, and that dysplasia can lead to neoplasia. Okay, senile endometritis is a risk factor, and the liver pathologies. Okay. How a liver pathology or having some liver pathology is a risk factor to develop the endometrial cancer? It's very clear that the estrogens are getting metabolized inside the liver. Whenever there is some liver pathology, the estrogens are not getting metabolized in, inside the liver. So that estrogens are going to stay in the body for longer duration. So estrogenic stimulation can be there or estrogenic stimulation can be expressed on the uterine endometrium for longer duration that can cause endometrial cancer and ovarian cancers ovarian cancers i can i can say something like uh, estrogen producing ovarian tumor something like a granulosa cell tumor how this is going to predispose to endometrial cancer why because the granulosa cell tumors we all know that they are going to produce estrogens so estrogens means endometrial cancer estrogens can cause hyperstimulation first of all hypoplasia and that may turn into malignancy okay guys this is a very very important risk factor having said that you should also know some other like you know syndromes or some genetic conditions which are associated with endometrial cancer so one such syndrome is a corpus cancer syndrome so what exactly is this corpus cancer syndrome sir See, if a female is having obesity, hypertension and diabetes mellitus is a more likely to get endometrial cancer. That's what is known as corpus cancer syndrome. Corpus means body, body of the uterus. Okay. So, corpus cancer syndrome means a female who is obese, hypertensive and diabetes mellitus, she is at a risk of developing the endometrial cancer. Now, Lynch syndrome or hereditary non-polyposis colorectal cancer. See this Lynch 2 syndrome, this Lynch 2 syndrome are hereditary non-polyposis colorectal cancer. These females who are having this mutation, okay. So these like you know, 
the females who are having this kind of mutation in her in their genes they are more likely almost 40 to 60 percent lifetime risk will be there okay if they are having this lynch 2 syndrome they are almost having 40 to 60 percent risk of developing endometrial cancer in their lifetime okay so what we should do okay there is a female now she is having this hnpcc gene mutation or like you know, they, they are having this lynch 2 gene mutation now we are we know that they are at a risk of getting this endometrial cancer so what we should do so what we will be doing is we will be doing this risk reducing total abdominal hysterectomy okay risk reducing surgeries like total abdominal hysterectomy with the bilateral salpingo oophorectomy once her family is completed why we are doing this we know that she is at risk of developing the cancer 60 percent lifetime risk of developing the endometrial cancer so what i will be doing is once she have completed her family okay once she have completed her family then i will be asking her to go for the risk rate using surgery that is a simple total abdominal hysterectomy along with the bilateral salpingo oophorectomy and a cowden syndrome this cowden syndrome is a hematomatous condition okay multiple hematomatous condition usually hematomas are benign tumors having this cowden syndrome will also be a risk factor okay at any time in her life she will she might develop this endometrial cancer and in her family guys this is very very important if in her family if any of the, her family relatives are having endometrial cancer or ovarian cancer or breast cancer or colorectal cancer means then this female is also at a risk of getting this endometrial cancer. Why I am saying it is a familially predisposed okay. This cancer is running in the families. Yes because of certain gene mutation this cancer is running in the families okay. So that is the reason why we will see what are those gene mutations we will see do not worry. So, family history of endometrial cancer or ovarian cancer and breast cancer and colorectal cancer is also a risk factor, okay. So, risk factors are very, very important, never ever forget, okay. Now, after seeing this risk factors, after knowing about the risk factors, see, I want you to remember one point here, okay. Again, I will discuss, but please remember, see, having associated with this risk factors means there is a female, she have developed the endometrial cancer and she is having one or more of these risk factors then that type of endometrial cancer is a type 1 endometrial cancer what does it mean by type 1 endometrial cancer type 1 endometrial cancer is a typical endometrial cancer which is usually associated with any of these risk factors if she is having an endometrial cancer which is usually not associated with this risk factor then that should be called as a type 2 endometrial cancers okay we will discuss we will discuss now after seeing the risk factors let us talk about the protective factors see smoking is considered to be protective why smoking is considered to be protective guys because smoking inhibits the peripheral aromatization so androgens are not going to be converted into estrogens so estrogen levels will go down that's something good so smoking is a risk factor pregnancy is a risk factor multiparity is a risk factor sorry not risk factor it's a protective factor okay smoking is a protective factor pregnancy is a protective factor multiparity is a protective factor and ocps are the protective factors why because smoking i have already explained you inhibits the peripheral aromatization that's something good pregnancy see there is a pregnancy means that's something good why because there is a break okay there is almost one and a half years break now multiparity many number of children means many breaks from the menstrual cycle that's something good now ocps we all know that combined oral contraceptive pills they are more like you know pregnancy inducing drugs or like you no know, uh, they will create an environment which is like something like a pseudo pregnancy state okay so that is the reason why ocps taking ocps creates a pseudo pregnancy state in the body and that is something very very good here why because having a pseudo pregnancy state is good why because having a pregnancy is good in the same way having pseudo pregnancy state is also good okay simple now Smoking is a risk factor for cervical cancer, but smoking is a protective factor for endometrial cancer. Guys, never ever forget smoking is a protective for endometrial cancer, multiparity protective factor and uh, pregnancy is a protective factor and oral contraceptive pills are uh, protective factors. Now, after this, let's see the classification of endometrial cancer. So, what is the classification? Histopathologically, okay, histopathologically, there are different types of endometrial cancers, but the most important type is 
endometroid adenocarcinoma which is most common endometroid adenocarcinoma is the most common type of endometrial cancer which is having a very good prognosis but important point to be noted is papillary serous carcinomas papillary serous carcinomas clear cell carcinomas they are most malignant like you know they are most malignant cancers okay which is most common endometroid adenocarcinoma is very very good okay endometroid adenocarcinoma is most common and it's very good type of cancer why because it's having a good prognosis but which are having the worst prognosis are most malignant it's a papillary cancers and clear cell cancers they are having they are having most malignancy okay now after saying this let's see the grading of this endometrial cancers now what exactly are these grades guys grades means for example on the histopathological slide on the histopathological side you have taken the sampling of this cancer okay you have taken the sampling of this cancer now if the tumor cells are well differentiated means you can perfectly demarcate the cells and you can totally see the normal morphological architecture of the cells okay then it is a well differentiated cell so that's a grade 1 cell in a grade 2 in a grade 2 what's happening guys there is a moderate differentiation there is moderate differentiation and in grade 3 the cells are very poorly differentiated or undifferentiated cells so these grades are also the histopathological examination basis or i can say the grades are based on the histopathological examination please concentrate here different endometrial cancers you know different endometrial cancers like endocarcinoma papillary serous endocarcinoma or clear cell carcinoma all of them are also based on histopathology and grades are also based on histopathology now these grades you can see if it is a grade 1 they are well differentiated and also there are less than 5 percent of the solid areas what does i mean by see on a histopathological slide see if, if, if the tumor cells are clumping like this if they are getting a coagulum of if they are if you are having a coagulum of this tumor cells in one place together that should be called as a solid area okay that should be called as a solid area see in the entire slide if they are occupying less than five percent of the area that should be a grade one if almost if almost in the slide okay if this tumor cells if these tumor cells are like you know if the, if the coagulum of the tumor cells okay if the coagulum of the tumor cells if they are occupying more than 50 percent area means that is a grade three see here also tumor cells are present these are also tumor cells but it's not a solid area so solid area is nothing but a coagulum or a clumping of these tumor cells okay this is a histopathological examination based grades okay so now how many like you know histopathologically the endometrial cancer is divided into different different variants and different different grades now please concentrate different types of endometrial cancer types of endometrial cancer how many types of endometrial cancers are there type 1 type 2 so i have already said to you if an endometrial cancer which is associated with the risk factors which we have discussed already then that should be called as a type 1 endometrial cancer and type 2 means which is usually not associated with any of that following risk factors this is something atypical okay now let's see type 1 endometrial cancers are usually seen in which age groups guys 50 to 60 years of age okay but type 2 endometrial cancers are seen in 70 years of age now what are the risk factors guys i have already said you type 1 is associated with all those risk factors which we have already seen type 1 associated with hyperhistrogenic states obesity anovulatory conditions like pcos nulliparity okay uh, adult onset diabetes mellitus hnpcc gene mutations lynch 2 syndrome okay all that but remember that the type 2 endometrial carcinoma okay a type 2 endometrial cancer is happening in a atrophic background okay type 1 is happening in a hyperplasia background okay it's see there is a precursor lesion called endometrial hypoplasia first of all there is endometrial hypoplasia that endometrial hypoplasia is getting converted into endometrial cancer that is a type 1 but in type 2 the endometrial hypoplasia is not happening okay so there is atrophy okay at the end there is atrophy okay see precursor sorry precursor lesions are seen in the type 1 endometrial cancer but there is no such precursor lesion in the type 2 endometrial cancers now what are the types see type 1 includes type 1 includes which variants guys it's a endometroid adenocarcinoma okay we have already seen 
ఐ హ్యావ్ సెడ్ ఇండోమెట్రాయిడ్ ఇడినో కార్సినోమా ఇస్ సంథింగ్ గుడ్ వై బికాస్ ఇండోమెట్రాయిడ్ ఇడినో కార్సినోమా ఇస్ హ్యాపనింగ్ ఇన్ ద బ్యాక్గ్రౌండ్ ఆఫ్ సమ్ ప్రీకర్సర్ లీజన్ ఇఫ్ దర్ ఈస్ ఎ ప్రీకర్సర్ లీజన్ దట్స్ గుడ్ వై బికాస్ దట్ ప్రీకర్సర్ లీజన్ ఈస్ గోయింగ్ టు కాస్ సమ్ సిమ్టమ్స్ అండ్ దట్ సిమ్టమ్స్ విల్ బ్రింగ్ ద పేషెంట్ టు ద డాక్టర్ సో దట్ షీ విల్ బీ హ్యావింగ్ లైక్ ఇనిషియేషన్ ఆఫ్ ద లైక్ యూ నో మేనేజ్మెంట్ ఇన్ ద ఎర్లీ పీరియడ్ ఇట్ సెల్ఫ్ ఆర్ ద ఎర్లీ స్టేజ్ ఇట్ సెల్ఫ్ so endometrioid adenocarcinoma is happening in the background of some precursor lesion and it is associated with the following risk factors okay which we have already discussed so it's a type 1 adenocarcinoma which is having a good prognosis okay now but type 2 i have already said clear cell carcinomas and papillary serous carcinomas they are most malignant and they are coming under type 2 endometrial cancers these two variants are coming under type 2 endometrial cancers which are all which i have already said having a bad prognosis or worst prognosis now the gene like you know the, the mutations associated type 1 endometrial carcinoma it is associated with the mutation in p10 genes and msi gene okay p10 mutation okay p10 mutations are associated with the type 1 endometrial cancer this is very very important p53 gene mutations are seen in clear cell and papillary serous variants so that will be seen in the type 2 endometrial cancers so metastasis guys if it is a type 1 endometrial cancer there will be metastasis to lymph nodes ovaries but if it is a type 2 endometrial cancer there will be metastasis to peritoneum which is very bad okay peritoneal involvement is bad now prognosis type 1 good prognosis type 2 bad prognosis so this is all about the types of endometrial cancers we have seen the grades of endometrial cancers and we have seen the variants of endometrial cancers okay based on histopathology now having said that what are the clinical features of this endometrial cancer if a female is having its endometrial cancers how she is going to present to the clinic so the peak incidence of this endometrial cancer is 60 years that's already we have seen the mean age for the endometrial cancer is 60 years now what is the most common complaint see if she is having this endometrial cancer she is go- she is going to present with the irregular vaginal bleeding or acyclical bleeding she is having this irregular vaginal bleeding okay why because this is like you know there is too much amount of this endometrium and it will be shedding out and that causes the bleeding okay so irregular vaginal bleeding will be there there will be pyometra okay there will be pus formation that the pus ex- protruding from this like you know from this tumor and that's getting collected inside her uterus and from her uterus that's coming out of her vagina that causes a vaginal discharge foul smelling vaginal discharge will be there in the background of a pyometra and there will be mild pain there will be mild pain which occurs every day at the same time for 1 to 2 hours this is not this is because of the referring pain referring pain to the inferior okay referring pain to the uh iliac fossa okay or hypogastrium this is known as simpson's pain what exactly is the simpson's pain guys simpson's pain is a referred pain to the hypogastrium or iliac fossa which is happening at the same time but at the end of the day what is that important point which you have to keep in mind that is what is the most common complaint irregular vaginal bleeding okay that's the important point you have to keep in mind and also you have to know that usually how cancers are going to present usually cancers present, uh, present with decrease in weight decrease in appetite decrease, uh, decrease in the blood that is anemia uh, with a pain so much amount of pain so these are usually the cancer symptoms like decrease weight anorexia and all the stuff but endometrial cancer patients usually they are obese females okay they are having a lot of fat on their body so do they look like you know decrease weight no so please remember that the typical features of cancers like weight loss loss of appetite cancer cachexia they are usually absent with the endometrial cancer okay simpson's pain is present with endometrial cancer because of a referring of the pain to the hypogastrium okay so well and good now see already the female is a 60 year old female already she is a 60 year old female and now she is having the bleeding so there will be postmenopausal bleeding okay there will be postmenopausal bleeding with the endometrial cancer but the important point to be noted here is endometrial cancer is not the most common cause of postmenopausal bleeding there are other causes see already our female is a 60 year old female now she is having this endometrial cancer and she will bleed for sure my point is there is bleeding after menopause so this is a postmenopausal bleeding but endometrial cancer is not the most common cause of postmenopausal bleeding so what is the most common cause of postmenopausal bleeding see it is ca cervix or cervical cancer is the most common cause of 
पोस्ट मेनोपॉजल ब्लीडिंग इन इंडिया एंड वर्ल्ड वाइड ओके इंडिया एंड वर्ल्ड वाइड इट इज सी एस सर्विक्स बट इन स्पेसिफिक इफ दे आस्क यू इन स्पेसिफिक स्पेसिफिकली मोस्ट कॉमन कैंसर ओके मोस्ट कॉमन कैंसर कॉजिंग पोस्ट मेनोपॉजल ब्लीडिंग इन डेवलप्ड कंट्रीज इन डेवलप्ड कंट्रीज दे आर मेंशनिंग मीन्स दैट इज एट्रोफिक एंडोमेट्राइटिस और सेनाइल एंडोमेट्राइटिस ओके दैट इज द मोस्ट कॉमन काज ऑफ पोस्ट मेनोपॉजल ब्लीडिंग इन द वेस्टर्न कंट्रीज ओके नाउ हैविंग सेड दैट लेट्स कंटिन्यू स्टेजिंग ऑफ द एंडोमेट्रियल कैंसर नाउ गाइज द स्टेजिंग विच यू आर गोइंग टू डू राइट नाउ इज द सर्जिकल स्टेजिंग ओके इट्स नॉट द क्लिनिकल स्टेजिंग इट्स द सर्जिकल स्टेजिंग all the cancers in the gynae are staged surgically okay this is what i have already said in the cervical cancer again i am repeating all cancers are staged surgically except cervical cancer now what i am going to do guys see whenever i came to know that there is endometrial cancer okay now uh, i have i have done the biopsy i have done the fractional curettage and the fractional curettage it's very clear that there are atypical cells and there is stromal invasion now once there is stromal invasion that i am very much sure that there is endometrial cancer now what i will be doing is i will be doing the surgery first i will do the surgery later i will know what is the stage of cancer okay see it's not something like you know according to the stage we are not going to do the surgery it's not something like that what we will be doing is first of all we will perform the surgery we will take out all the tissues and we will send it to the path lab there they are going to say like you know which stage of endometrial cancer she is having so the staging is done surgically okay in the surgery what i am going to do i am going to do total abdominal hysterectomy with bilateral salpingo oophorectomy along with the total abdominal hysterectomy bilateral salpingo hysterectomy i am also going to do pelvic and peritoneal lymph node sampling should be done along with that if it is especially if it is especially papillary or clear cell cancers then i will also be doing omentectomy and peritoneal biopsy why because these are very dangerous cancers okay so that's the reason why i, I just want to know whether there is any uh, involvement of the omentum or peritoneum so it's very simple that the staging is surgical staging now let's go further now what are the different stages in the endometrial cancer now stage 1 stage 1 is very simple that the cancer is limited to the uterus cancer is lying inside the uterus now stage 1 was further divided into 1a and 1b what is the difference sir? in 1a this endometrium uh, let me show you here this is if this is a uterus if this is a uterus here is our endometrium okay this is our endometrium if this endometrium or the endometrial cancer if it is involving only 50% of the myometrium okay this endometrial cancer it is invading only 50% of the myometrium then it should be called as stage 1a so stage 1a is cancer is confined to the uterus and less than 50% of the myometrium is involved and in stage 1b the cancer is confined to the uterus but more than 50% of the myometrium is involved means the full thickness of the myometrium is total myometrium is involved now that is stage 1 stage 2 is very very simple once if the cervix is involved okay once if the metastasis is, is happening to the cervix okay cervix is getting involved then the staging will be stage 2 okay so after the surgery i will be knowing this okay after removing uh, after removing this uterus cervix and all i will be checking okay how much amount of myometrium is involved whether the cervix is involved or not once if the cervix is involved i will be i will be saying that it is stage 2 endometrial cancer something like that okay now in stage 3 the cancer is involving the serosa okay it invades the serosa or adnexa means like the whole myometrium involved now the cancer is coming out so the adnexa okay now now, now the adnexa is getting involved at the serosa okay the outermost layer the outermost layer is getting involved okay the serosa we know right endometrium myometrium and perimetrium that serosa layer that serosa layer is getting involved now now stage 3b now there is a parametrial involvement you know the parametrium the sides to the uterus okay the sides to the uterus whatever is there that broad ligament and all the stuff now they are getting involved so parametrial involvement is stage 3b now in mean 3c stage 3c was further divided into c1 and c2 what is the difference see if the pelvic lymph nodes are affected means if there is a metastasis to pelvic lymph nodes means then it is c1 and if there is metastasis to the para aortic lymph nodes means then it is a c2 now stage 1 cancer in the uterus 
less than 50 percent of the myometrium stage 1a and stage 1b means more than 50 percent of the myometrium is involved stage 2 cervix is involved stage 3 in stage 3 there is a stage 3a where the serosa is getting involved stage 3b where the parametrium is getting involved stage 3c in stage 3c c1 and c2 are there in c1 pelvic lymph nodes are getting affected and c2 Paraiotic lymph nodes are getting affected and stage 4 stage 4 there is a almost bladder it's a, it's, it's a more uh, kind of uh, almost end stages okay these are uh, where the bladder and bowel are getting affected okay the bowel and bladder are getting affected or I can say there is a metastasis to the bowel and bladder and 4b 4b there is a distant metastasis to the abdomen and inguinal lymph nodes this is a very very important mcq inguinal lymph node involvement what is the stage of endometrial cancer 4b parametrial involvement what is the stage of endometrial cancer Parametrial involvement is a stage 3b important MCQ. Okay, so these are what you have to keep in your mind. And what is the spread? What is the mode of spread of this cancer? The most common mode of spread is a direct extinction. Okay, direct spread. But when I am discussing about the when I am discussing about the cervical cancer, there I have said the most common mode of spread is the lymphatic route. Okay, lymphatic spread is the most common spread of cervical cancer but endometrial cancer the most common mode of spread is a direct extension so these are the stages of the cancer now when i came to know about the staging once i have performed the surgery then i will be knowing the stage which means already i have done the surgery which means already i have done the treatment i have removed the I have removed the uterus, I have removed the tubes, I have removed the ovaries. Along with that, I have removed pelvic lymph nodes, paraiotic lymph nodes. Means already treatment is done. So treatment is done along with the staging. Okay. So to make the concepts more clear, okay, I will just show you a table which will be very much useful to solve the MCQs. Guys, please concentrate. In stage 1A1, grade 1 and grade 2 it's a, it's a stage 1a not one it's a stage 1a in stage 1a and grade 1 and 2 see i have already said you the grades okay i have already discussed about the grades with you what exactly is grade 1 grade 2 and grade 3 now if it is a stage 1a and grade 1 and 2 what is the type of surgery that should be done it is total abdominal hysterectomy with bilateral solving ovarectomy that's already we have done it along with that we have also do the lymph node sampling now please remember if the tumor size st stage 1a means it's a very small tumor less than 50 percent of the myometrium is involved maybe the tumor is very very small if the tumor is less than 2 centimeters means there is no need to do the lymph node dissection lymph node sampling is not needed in stage 1a one grade 1 and grade 2 if the tumor size is less than 2 centimeters okay now if it is if it is more than 2 centimeters means then we can do pelvic lymph node dissection okay pelvic lymph node sampling can be done if the tumor size is greater than 2 centimeters now stage 1a same here also stage 1a here also stage 1a but here it's a grade 3 grade 3 means the solid areas the clumping of the tumor cells is more than 50 percent on the slide something more dangerous right now in this condition stage 1a 1 grade 3 and also for stage 1b see we are, we are still in the stage 1 we are still in the stage 1 see it's a stage 1a it's a stage 1b now here again same surgery okay total abdominal hysterectomy bilateral solving of hysterectomy again i am repeating according to the stage we are not doing the surgery already surgery is done once the surgery is done then we are going to keep the then we are going to give the staging okay now here in this condition we will be doing both pelvic lymph node direct dissection and paraiotic lymph node dissection okay in stage 1a grade 3 and stage 1b i will be doing total abdominal hysterectomy with bilateral solving of oophorectomy i will also be doing pelvic and paraiotic lymph node dissection now something very important point here is what should i do if it is stage 2 okay if what, what should i do if it is a stage 2 means when i'm performing when i'm performing the surgery okay now itself when i'm performing performing the surgery if i can see that the cervix is also involved 
okay if the cervix is involved then i am not going to do just simple total abdominal hysterectomy with bilateral solving oophorectomy i will be doing a modified radical hysterectomy known as wertheim's hysterectomy okay wertheim's hysterectomy or modified modified radical hysterectomy should be done once the cervix is involved okay here also i will be doing pelvic lymph node sampling and paraiotic lymph node dissection okay that's common see Wertheim hysterectomy we will discuss in a separate video where like you know in Wertheim hysterectomy we will be removing you know more it's a more extensive surgery we are moving we are removing certain more extra structures like almost upper one third of the vagina is being removed certain extra structures are being removed so more radical okay now in stage 3 and stage 4 if I see there is so much amount of cancer spreading if there is so much cancer spreading then I will be doing a debulking surgery very very important so debulking surgery is the option for stage 3 and 4 along with pelvic and paraiotic lymph node dissection very very important 99.9% .9 of the time a question will came from risk factor staging and treatment okay now okay I have done the surgery now what should I do after the surgery or after the like you know uh, operation what I should do that's a post operative therapy. So in the post operative therapy what we will be doing is see if it is a stage 1A and grade 1 and 2 there is no need of any post operative therapy. There is no need of any radiation or there is no need of any chemotherapy. Now if it is a stage 1A grade 3 and stage 1B then I will be going for the radiotherapy. Same with the case of a stage 2, okay, if it is, if the, if the cervix is getting involved, we will say it is a stage 2, here also we can go with the radiotherapy. Now, if it is a stage 3 and 4, I will be doing a debulking surgery, pelvic and paraiotic lymph node dissection, along with that, I will be doing radiotherapy and chemotherapy. Chemotherapy is most important here, okay, chemotherapy plus or minus radiotherapy can be done for stage 4. If there is a too much extension of the cancer, I am trying to remove the as much as possible. I am trying to remove as much as the tumor, tumor possible. That's a debulking surgery. Okay. So that's the treatment for the endometrial cancer. Now following that, let's see the prognostic factors for the endometrial cancer. What are the good prognostic factors and what are the bad prognostic factors? The most important prognostic factor is the staging. Okay, staging is the most important prognostic factor. If she is having stage 1A, that's good. If she is having, if she is in stage 3 and 4, that's very, very bad. So, staging is a good prognostic factor. After that, it's a lymph node metastasis or lymph node status. If the lymph nodes are involved, means bad. If lymph nodes are not involved, means good. Now, age of the patient, okay. Age of the patient is also an important prognostic factor. I have already said you the stage is important prognostic factor. And histological types like endometrial adenocarcinoma, endometroid adenocarcinomas are something good. But clear cell variant or papillary cell variants, they are most malignant types. Myometrial penetration. If myometrial penetration is there, that's bad. If, myome if there is more myometrial penetration means more bad. Less myometrial penetration means good, something like that, okay. If extension to the cervix, extension to the cervix means it's almost second stage, okay. If cervix is involved, bad. If cervix is not involved, that's something good, okay, something like that. Tumor greater than 2 centimeters. Tumor greater than 2 centimeters, we all, it's a very simple, right. If the, the tumor is large in size, bad prognosis. Tumor less than 2 centimeters, good prognosis. Now, hormone receptor status, hormone receptor sensitivity. Now, if the if the receptors if the, the the receptors on the endometrium if they are still responding to the treatment if they are still responding to the progesterone and all the stuff then it is good if the hormone receptors are positive means still they are working then it is a better prognosis or a good prognosis and what about the ploidy status if these cells if these tumor cells if they are having this nu ploidy okay if they are having this nu ploidy which means like you know, abnormal number of sets of chromosomes. If this tumor cells there contains abnormal number of chromosomes, that's something good. Okay, why? Because they can be better treated. They can be better treated. Okay. So ploidy status, having a new ploidy, better prognosis. And oncogene expression, like you know, her two new expression and Keras expression, they are having a bad prognosis. Okay, one important, point, one important point I want you to remember that the most important prognostic factor is staging. Okay, is staging and endometroid endocarcinomas have a good prognosis and also remember the type 1 endometrial cancers. Example is endometroid, endometrial, endometroid endocarcinoma that is having a good prognosis. Okay, 
so those are something very very important and hormone receptor uh, status uh, positive hormone receptor status is a good prognosis please keep that point in mind so post operative therapy already we have discussed this like you know if it's a low risk cancers low risk cancers like you know stage 1a okay stage 1a grade 1 and grade 2 you no need to have any management any post man post operative management is not required and if it is a intermediate risk intermediate risk means stage 1a1 but it is grade 3 it's a grade 3 then i will be going for the pelvic radiotherapy okay now if it is a high risk means stage 3 and stage 4 high risk cancer then i will be doing the debulking surgery after debulking surgery what i will be doing is chemotherapy as well as the radiotherapy okay the chemotherapeutic agent what i will be using is a paclitaxel okay paclitaxel along with that cisplatin and doxorubicin can also be used okay so along with chemotherapy we can use radiotherapy also okay guys hope the lecture is helpful thank you Welcome back students now in this series of gynecological oncology let's discuss about the ovarian tumors now ovarian tumors can be benign in nature or they can be malignant in nature now let's see what are the differences between a benign ovarian tumors and malignant ovarian tumors see benign ovarian tumors they are going to be mostly seen in reproductive age group women but on the contrary the malignant ovarian tumors they are going to be seen in extremes of ages that means like what they can be seen in a pre pubertal age group and post menopausal women so what does i mean by see if there is a tumor in a reproductive age group women that tumor can most likely be benign tumor if there is a ovarian mass in a post menopausal women and that mass can be mostly malignant in nature okay see anyway exceptions are there see these are certain guidelines kind of thing okay these are not the gold gold standard points okay now see these benign masses are usually unilocular and cystic in nature but if it's a malignant tumor if it's a malignant mass then mostly it is solid in consistency with multiple septa if you see on my top whatever you are seeing is a cancer it's a serous cystadenoma it's not serous cystadenoma it's a serous cystadenocarcinoma of the ovary where you can see a thick septa where you can see a thick septa so because of this thick septa you can see it's a multi loculated there are many many locules inside which there is a solid growth so what i am trying to put into your mind is usually malignant masses are solid in consistency with the thick septa inside them and they are solid tumors okay now and also you can see this papillary excrescences or papillary outgrowths on the surface see you can have all these this kind of papillary outgrowths which are coming out so these are papillary excrescences and that too they are mainly associated with the malignant ovarian tumors now if it's a benign tumor mostly the they will involve a single ovary what does i mean by unilocular involvement if it is a benign mass unilocular involvement will be there if it is a malignant mass both the ovaries will be affected okay so malignant tumors are ovarian cancers cancers will have bilateral involvement benign tumors will have unilateral involvement okay so everything is clear now let's discuss about the risk factors for ovarian cancer guys what and all i'm going to discuss right now this 15 they are causing they are predisposing a female for developing this ovarian cancer there are 15 risk factors but let's discuss the main important risk factors guys it's very simple that more the ovary is functioning more the ovary is getting stimulated more number of ovulations more the ovary is under the stress more number of ovulations more stress in the ovary more working ovary is under more stress so what i am trying to put into your mind if ovary is under so much stress then that ovary can develop this cancers so all these risk factors somehow 
make the ovary keeps the ovary under the stress let's see early menarch and late menopause start with the early menarch what does it mean by early menarch early menarch it's very simple here the female is starting her menstrual cycle in a very much younger age for example she is supposed to start her menstrual cycle by 15 years of age or 14 years of age what if she have started her menstrual cycles by 8 years of age or 10 years of age 14 10 so 4 extra years of menstrual cycles 4 extra years of this ovarian function if 4 extra years of this ovulation is happening so ovary is working for 4 extra years so ovary may got stressed out and it may gone crazy and it can produce the ovarian cancer the same way same concept is applicable to late menopause she is supposed to have a, her menopause by 50 years of age what if she is having her menopause at 58 years of age she is having eight extra years of ovarian function eight extra years of ovulation so ovulation all this stuff is very much hectic for the ovary and ovary gone crazy and she have developed the ovarian cancer okay now obesity is a risk factor okay obesity is a risk factor for many things okay here also now endometriosis see we have already seen the endometriosis which is associated with the hyper estrogenic state see when we are discussing about the endometriosis when we are discussing the topic about endometriosis there we have discussed that these endometrial deposits are going to fall on to the uh, ovaries and may cause endometroid ovarian cancer see the endometriosis is associated with endometroid ovarian cancer later we will discuss that and it is also associated with the clear cell cancer of the ovary so endometriosis is a risk factor nulli parity or infertility is also a risk factor why why because if she is nulli paris means she is not having the pregnancy if she would have her pregnancy what will happen having pregnancy is something good why because she will get almost one and half years break okay one and a half years break from the menstrual cycles because of gestational amenorrhea and lactational amenorrhea she is not going to have her menstrual cycles for one and a half year that's something good but if she is nulliparous or she is infertile means she is not having pregnancy she is not having a break from the menstrual cycles so that keeps her ovaries continuously working continuous ovulation and that's not something good for the ovaries continuous stress is not good okay that's what i'm trying to put into your mind and this asbestos exposure asbestos is a carcinogenic agent which is thought to cause ovarian cancer and this asbestos in some quantity is also present in the talc okay in some quantity it's present in talc so keeping perineal talc some females will be keeping this perineal talc to keep they the vulval regions dry not to uh, get moist over there so keeping this perineal talc on daily basis so this perineal talc with this asbestosis will find its way into the blood circulation and this asbestos may reach the ovary and cause the ovarian cancer something true and genetic mutations genetic mutations will be seen in this lynch syndrome braca1 gene mutation braca2 gene mutation which we are going to say in the next slide see Lynch syndrome what exactly is that it's a it's a disorder where there is a mutation of a DNA mismatch repair genes because of the mutation of certain genes which are going to discuss later important genes are there because of the mutation of those genes there is this development of ovarian cancer see hereditary non-polyposis colorectal cancer which is also called as Lynch syndrome is not only associated with the development of ovarian cancer ovarian cancer is a part of Lynch syndrome but getting this Lynch syndrome because of the mutation of certain genes will increase the risk of colorectal cancer that's the most common cancer which is seen with the Lynch syndrome endometrial cancer ovarian cancer gastric cancer kidney cancer bladder cancer many cancers are seen as a part of Lynch syndrome and we all know that BRCA1 gene mutation BRCA2 gene mutation which are associated with the development of ovarian cancers we have seen that and the anovulatory conditions like PCOS and HRT, see the PCOS and HRT, they are the risk factor for endometrial cancer, but they are also thought to be a risk factor for ovarian cancers. Okay, now ovulation inducing drug. How a ovulation inducing drug can be a risk factor for ovarian cancer? Why not? In the name itself, it's very clear. Ovulation induction means 
it's stimulating the ovary so much to cause the ovulation so this stimulation may make the ovary to go mad and ovary become cancer okay so that's something important and smoking so smoking i will be discussing you again but remember smoking can also be a risk factor for ovarian cancer especially mucinous histologies okay when i am discussing about the different types of ovarian cancer epithelial ovarian cancer uh, germ cell cancer stromal cancers like metastatic cancers there we will know what is this mucinous histology which means simple a tumor with mucin okay so we have completed the risk factors for ovarian cancer now let's go further now what is this lynch syndrome lynch syndrome it's an autosomal dominant disorder where there is mutation of where there is a mutation of dna mismatch repair genes the most common mutation is mlh1 gene mutation okay mlh1 gene mutation and msh2 gene mutation so because of the mutation of these genes the female can develop a multiple cancers in her body now what are what is the most common cancer the most common cancer is a colorectal cancer followed by endometrial cancer next the ovarian cancer see what you can see here having lynch syndrome having lynch syndrome increases the risk of getting this ovarian cancer by almost 20 percent that's what i am trying to put into your mind okay okay now let's talk about the braca1 gene mutations and braca gene braca2 gene mutations see braca1 gene is present on chromosome number 17 and braca2 gene is present on chromosome number 13 see it's very important that having braca1 gene mutation is having the maximum risk of getting the ovarian cancer by almost 40 percent okay see braca2 gene mutation also causes ovarian cancer but only 15 percent braca1 gene mutation 40 percent chances that she will have ovarian cancer so this female who is having this braca1 gene mutation she is at a risk of getting ovarian cancer by 40 percent so she is a high risk individual so what we have to do we have to screen this female okay we have to do the screening in this female see normally screening for ovarian cancer is not indicated why because ovarian cancers are rare cancers but this female is a high risk female she is having a risk of almost 40 percent for getting the ovarian cancer so what we have to do we have to screen her okay so annual screening is done in these females who are having this braca1 gene mutation so first of all how we will know that there is a female who is having this braca1 gene mutation how means if a female is having a first degree relative with ovarian cancer okay there is a female and her first degree relative like mother or sister they are having ovarian cancer now she is coming to the clinic and she said like you know she is having some symptoms or like she came to the clinic for general routine examination and she said that my mother or my sister died with this ovarian cancer now just think about braca1 gene mutation she might also have a braca1 gene mutation why because her first degree relative died with ovarian cancer because of braca1 gene mutations in them so now I am suspecting the same BRCA1 gene mutation may be present in this female. So what I will be doing, I am going to screen this female who is at a high risk. So I am screening her. What I will be doing is, I am doing annual screening with transvaginal sonography and CA125 levels. We all know that CA125 levels, they are the tumor marker for the ovarian cancers. Now let's see. If a first degree relative if the ovarian cancer or BRCA1 gene mutation is there, what is the risk of getting ovarian cancer? See, imagine that I am a female, that my mother is having this BRCA1 gene mutation and she is having this ovarian cancer. Now, what is the risk of me getting that BRCA1 gene mutation and ovarian cancer? How much percent is? It will be somewhere around 2 to 10 percent. There is a risk. Okay, so 2 to 10 percent chances are there. If a first degree relative is having this ovarian cancer okay but if i have if i have braca1 gene mutation means then me developing ovarian cancer 40 percent risk okay okay well and good so now what i will do there is a female who is having this braca1 gene mutation now she is in front of me 
and what i will be doing is i will ask her see you are having 40% risk of getting this ovarian cancer because you are having this BRCA1 gene mutation now what i have to suggest her is the moment you complete your family okay the moment you complete your family better go with the total abdominal hysterectomy with bilateral salpingo oophorectomy okay so the moment she completes her family it's better to remove her ovaries because she is having a more risk of developing this ovarian cancer so what i will be doing is as there is a high risk of almost 40% i will be doing total abdominal hysterectomy with bilateral salpingo oophorectomy once her family is completed so this is very very important now braca2 gene mutation see these braca2 gene mutations are also associated with the development of ovarian cancers but less only 15% and we have already seen that the braca gene is present on the chromosome number 13 now one important point is See, you can have a ovarian cancer just sporadically, simple sporadic cancer or you can have ovarian cancer in the family that is a hereditary ovarian cancer because of Lynch syndrome or BRCA1 gene mutation or BRCA2 gene mutation. Now my question is, see if it is sporadic in nature, simple, you are having some risk factor and it simply came sporadic, okay, sporadic in onset. Then sporadic ovarian cancers in a female are going to be seen by 60 to 70 years of age okay so usually sporadic ovarian cancers present at 60 to 70 years of age this is something important but if it's because of hereditary reasons it is a hereditary ovarian cancer then the onset will be much earlier it's not 60 or 70 much earlier so it's going to be present by 50 years of age hereditary ovarian cancers present much earlier okay so that's something very much important after discussing the risk factors let's now discuss about the protective factors now what are the protective factors see nulliparity infertility it's a risk factor but protective factors are multiparity having lots and lots of children is something good it's protective against ovarian cancer because too many children too many breaks too many breaks for the menstrual cycle too many breaks for the ovaries so ovaries are very much happy because they are not totally under the stress okay they are simply relaxing so they won't go mad okay so multiparity is protective factor oral contraceptive pills they are also protective factor why because we all know that combined estrogen progesterone pills they are more progesterogenic in nature it just creates a pseudo pregnancy state Okay, pregnancy is something good for the ovarian cancers why? because these oral contraceptive pills creates a pseudo pregnancy state that is something good here. Now why because taking oral contraceptive pills causes anovulation if there is no ovulation that is something good why because the ovaries are not ovulating they are not under the stress they are simply relaxing good. Now lactation is a protective factor why lactation is a protective factor why because if she is lactating, we all know that there will be lactational amenorrhea, break is there, ovaries can relax. Now, and certain surgeries like hysterectomy, salpingectomy and tubal ligation, these surgeries, they are protective because these surgeries, having any of these surgeries is protective. Why? Because, see it is thought to be the carcinogen spread, for example, just like a perineal tag which contain asbestosis. See the carcinogens can find its way to the ovaries via the vulva, vagina, cervix, uterus, fallopian tubes and from there into the ovaries. Now if you remove this uterus, okay you have removed the uterus or you have done the tubal ligation or you have removed the tubes. Now having any of these surgeries will take out, will knock down the pathway or passage for the carcinogens. So carcinogens are not getting a way to reach the ovaries. One of the ways lost. So these surgeries are thought to be a protective factor and also important. A physical exercise is also very good protective factor because obesity is a risk factor. Exercise is a protective factor. Simple opposite. Okay. Now, after discussing this, let's discuss about different types of ovarian tumors now we are going to discuss a different types of ovarian tumors for that whatever you are seeing in my background that plays a very crucial role okay crucial role now 
whatever you are seeing in my background that's a cross section of ovary where you can see these epithelial cells okay you can see these epithelial cells which are lining the ovary okay this epithelial cells whatever you are whatever i'm highlighting here they are the epithelial cells lining the ovary and what you are seeing here are the germ cells and this in between the germ cells whatever is having this all material or this all this area is a stroma why i'm showing you all this anatomy here because you can have a tumor from the epithelial cell from the epithelial cell you can have a tumor so ovarian tumors are divided into epithelial ovarian tumors germ cell ovarian tumors stromal ovarian tumors okay sex cord stromal ovarian tumors we will discuss don't worry now how many major types of ovarian tumors are there guys epithelial ovarian tumors it's not a one single tumor epithelial ovarian tumors which includes so 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 we will discuss don't worry epithelial ovarian tumors germ cell ovarian tumors stromal ovarian tumors are a tumor may not be intrinsic or i can say a cancer may not be intrinsic it may come from some outside some other from outside and it may get lodged inside the ovaries and it can proliferate so metastatic tumors so how many types of ovarian tumors you may expect there will be epithelial ovarian cell tumors germ cell ovarian cell tumors stromal ovarian cell tumors and metastatic ovarian tumors now let's see the classification see i have already discussed here ovarian tumors they are epithelial in nature they can be epithelial in nature now what are the examples of epithelial ovarian tumors the examples are c serous tumors mucinous tumors brenner's tumor endometrioid tumor and clear cell tumor guys this one slide is the heart for entire ovarian tumors if you know this slide entire ovarian tumors will be very very easy so you have to know this is the who classification for the ovarian tumors where the ovarian tumors are mainly classified into four types and which are having every type is having subtypes for example epithelial ovarian tumors are divided into serous ovarian tumor mucinous ovarian tumor endometrioid tumor clear cell tumor and brenner tumor in the same way germ cell tumors are divided into teratomas dysgerminomas yolk sac tumors embryonal cancer choriocarcinoma and mixed type okay so this is very much important and we are going to discuss everything in detail okay we are going to discuss about one by one so now from where we have to start we have to st start from the epithelial ovarian tumors so without any delay let's start from the epithelial ovarian tumors now if i am saying epithelial ovarian tumors they are arising from the lining epithelium of the ovary so now we are going to start with the serous ovarian tumors and a mucinous ovarian tumors means we are going to see the differences in a one single table okay now in this slide what you are seeing is a serous ovarian tumor and mucinous ovarian tumor guys now i am saying serous ovarian tumor it's not a one single tumor serous ovarian tumors again can be malignant and again they can be benign so serous ovarian tumors you are having again two benign malignant so benign ones are called as serous cyst adenoma malignant ones are called as serous cyst adeno carcinoma in the same way mucinous tumors they can be benign they can be malignant if it is a benign we are going to call it as mucinous cyst adenoma why because it's a mucinous tumor mucinous cyst adenoma if it's benign if it is malignant it should be called as mucinous cyst adeno carcinoma okay so first of all why they are called as serous tumors sir why they are called as a mucinous tumors they are called as serous tumors why because they are filled with serous fluid the cysts are filled with a serous clear fluid why they are called as a mucinous tumors why because they are filled with this a mucinous material okay the entire tumors the cysts are filled with the mucinous material whatever you are seeing over here in the down they are serous cyst adenoma okay which is a unilocular tumor which is filled with the you can see the cystic appearance right simple cystic appearance which is filled with a clear fluid serous fluid on my top what you are seeing is a 
mucinous cystadenoma which is a multi loculated you can simply see there is a this septa which are present and these cysts which are which are filled with the mucinous material okay now ovarian involvement if it's a serous tumor okay if it's a serous tumor usually the serous tumors are bilateral in nature means both the sides you can have the serous tumor if it is a mucinous tumor they are usually unilateral mucinous tumors are unilateral in involvement serous tumors are usually bilateral in nature but a serous tumor can be unilateral as well as a mucinous tumor can be bilateral okay so please concentrate here that even mucinous tumors 10% of the time 10% of the time they can be bilateral in nature having said that see serous tumors are associated with certain mutation certain gene mutation and mucinous tumors are associated with certain gene mutation now what are the gene mutations which are seen with the serous tumors they are BRCA1 gene mutation BRCA2 gene mutation and P53 gene mutations can cause serous tumors and mucinous tumors are associated with the KRAS gene mutations now if I am talking about the tumor markers the tumor marker for a serous cystadenomas or serous tumors are CA125 for CA, like for both serous cystadenoma as well as serous, serous cystadenocarcinoma. Okay, I am just talking about the serous tumors. CA, carcinoembryonic antigen and CA199. Okay, so CA199 and carcinoembryonic antigen, they are the antigens for the mucinous tumors. Now, okay. So, what is the gross appearance? I have already said you that the serous tumors grossly, they are unilocular tumors which are filled with a clear serous fluid. But on the contrary, the mucinous tumors, they are multilocular. Okay, they are multilocular because they are having this septa in between. Because of the presence of this septa in between, okay, they will just looks like a honeycomb. You know how honeycomb looks like. So, because of the presence of septa in the tumor, it looks like a honeycomb. Now, and they are filled with the mucinous material, there is no doubt. Now, what about the microscopic appearance? Guys, this is the one area where most likely the questions are being asked. Okay, this is the one place you, you can have a question, you can expect a question. So, these tumor cells on histopathology, okay, under the microscope, if it's a serous tumor, the epithelium, the epithelium, these are the epithelial cell tumor. The epithelium looks like a fallopian tube. Okay, the microscopic appearance resembles a fallopian tube lining. And that too, under microscope, you can see samoma bodies, serous cystadenomas. Samoma bodies. What are the samoma bodies, guys? The tumor cells which are surrounded by the calcium. Okay, the calcium accumulation around the tumor cells. Serous cystadenomas, true. But the mucinous tumors, the epithelium, it just resembles the endocervical lining. Okay, well and good. Now, smoking, is it a risk factor or not? Have we studied smoking as a risk factor in the previous slide? Let's just see here. See, here, the 15th one, intentionally I haven't discussed over there. See, smoking is a risk factor for ovarian cancer. Yes, but for mucinous histologies, what does I mean by mucinous histology? Which means the tumors which are having this mucin content or like no, the mucin is there or the mucinous fluids are there inside the tumor. These are the mucinous histology tumors. Now, here what we are discussing is a mucinous tumor now. So, for mucinous tumor, smoking is a risk factor. Very, very important. Okay, well and good. Now, one more important point is, see, these mucinous tumors, they are having this mucin inside them and they are growing at any moment this tumors may simply rupture and pour out all this mucin content into the peritoneum and that causes inflammation inside the peritoneum and abdominal cavity so that causes pseudomyxoma peritonei so what is meant by pseudomyxoma peritonei it's simple nothing but the mucus content that the whole like you know, uh, this peritoneum, it's getting inflamed, okay, it's getting inflamed and fibros because of this uh, mucin which is getting released, extruded out of the ovarian tumors. The ovarian tumor simply got ruptured and all this mucin came out, okay. So, that's causing inflammation of the peritoneum and causing fibrosis of the peritoneum. This is pseudomyxoma peritonei. But important point is, most common cause of pseudomyxoma peritonei is 
appendix cancer cancer appendix is the most common cause of pseudomyxoma peritoneum and pseudomyxoma peritonei is also seen with mucinous tumors so what i want to put into your mind is the most common cause for the pseudomyxoma peritonei is not the mucinous ovarian tumors the most common cause for pseudomyxoma peritonei is cancer appendix and mucosal of appendix can also cause pseudo pseudomyxoma peritonei so having said that let's see some important single liners okay so out of all the ovarian tumors epithelial germ cell uh, sex cord strobal tumors metastatic tumors now what are the most common tumors see this is the one point i forgot to mention earlier that epithelial ovarian tumors are the most common ovarian tumors out of all the ovarian tumors epithelial ovarian tumors are most common tumors almost 90% of the ovarian tumors are epithelial in nature epithelial ovarian tumors now in epithelial ovarian tumors what are the most common tumors the most common tumors are serous tumors okay so please concentrate here guys the most common ovarian tumor is in epithelial ovarian tumors in op epithelial ovarian tumors the most common ovarian tumor is serous cyst adenoma which is benign in nature this one okay serous cyst adenoma is the most common followed by the most common ovarian cancer direct single line most common ovarian tumor serous cyst adenoma most common ovarian cancers are cyst adenocarcinoma okay so in a just wrap up i know i am repeating but it's very much important serous tumors benign serous cyst adenomas malignant serous cyst adenocarcinomas associated with braca1 gene mutation braca2 gene mutation and p53 gene mutation serous cyst adenomas they are having on histopathology they are having this swamoma bodies okay and the tumor marker is ca125 but when i am talking about the mucinous tumors they are multi loculated with multiple septa which is giving a honeycomb appearance they are associated with pseudomyxoma peritoneae because there is this mucin content inside them mucus content inside them okay so the epithelial lining resembles endocervix in the mucinous tumors but the serous tumors epithelial lining resembles fallopian tube or i can say in a simple way the tumor like you know these epithelial cells in this tumor they are simply resembling, resembling the fallopian tube okay now okay let's go further now guys we have completed we have completed the serous tumor mucinous tumor now let's discuss about the brenner tumor the moment i say brenner the first thing that's going to strike in my mind is a nest and a bus is popping out of it okay a nest and a bus why something like that see the moment i say brenner the bus is going to come into my mind bus b u s why with a nest why because this brenner tumor they are solid tumors okay brenner tumors are solid tumors and this brenner tumors they are 100% unilateral tumors okay 100% unilateral involvement solid tumors and these brenner tumors are encapsulated benign tumors okay so whatever you are seeing here see it's a solid inconsistency that tumor which you are seeing here it's a solid tumor and there is a capsule there is a capsule around this tumor it's encapsulated solid tumor 100% unilateral involvement b u s yes. okay so b9 b unilateral u and s yes. and it's having this rubbery consistency now why bus is coming to my mind bus because of b u s yes, as well as bus why why we use a bus for transportation trans t r a n s so transfer transportation for transitional epithelium so there in serous tumors we have clearly seen that the epithelial lining resembles a fallopian tube and in the mucinous tumor the epithelial lining resembles the endoscopic now here in brenner's tumor the cells they resemble transitional epithelium where in our body we have this transitional epithelium in the urinary bladder so there we are going to call it as a urothelium okay the lining epithelium of the urinary bladder is a urothelium 
it just they are similar okay so under the microscope it just looks like a urothelium that's what i'm trying to put in your mind so bus benign unilateral and solid in consistency and with a rubbery nature bus is used for transport trans transfer transitional epithelium okay so why this nest why this nest why because i repeatedly ask mcq if you are taking this tumor and if you are seeing under microscope you can see here on my top you can see like you know that tumor cells they are just like you know uh, they are just in the form of nests okay you can see these uh, tumor cells they are arranged like you know concentrically just they are looking like a nest so they are called as walthard cell nest okay there is a cell nest okay cells they are arranging concentrically and they are just forming a nest of cells so these are walthard cell nest so walthard cell nest is seen with brenner's tumors and if you see one single individual cell inside that cell you can see the nucleus which just looks like a coffee bean you can see a cell which is resembling a coffee bean so coffee bean nuclei is seen with brenner's tumors but also remember that this coffee bean nuclei is not only seen with the brenner's tumors but also seen with the granulosa cell tumors now what is this granulo granulosa cell tumor sir granulosa cell tumor is it is it a epithelial cell tumor or is it a germ cell tumor or is it a sex card stromal tumor now please concentrate so all this is to build up the concept granulosa cell tumor where is it see here it is there okay under sex card stromal tumors granulosa cell tumor is there so there also you can see this coffee bean nuclei and this brenner tumor it's the most common cause of it's the most common cause of pseudomyxis syndrome it's not pseudomyxoma peritoneae pseudomyxoma peritoneae is something seen with mucinous tumors of the ovary pseudomyxoma peritoneae but this is pseudomyxis syndrome see what is this pseudomyxis syndrome see pseudomyxis syndrome is due to fibroma ovary okay the most common cause of sorry not pseudomyxis syndrome mix syndrome usually the mix syndrome mix syndrome is because of fibroma ovary where the like ovary in this ovary in fibroma is associated with ascites and pleural effusion usually the mix syndrome is because of fibroma ovary where the patient is going to have ascites as well as pleural effusion but my question is same here also with brenner's tumor the patient is going to have the female is going to have ascites as well as pleural effusion which just looks like a mix syndrome but this is not because of fibroma ovary this is because of brenner's tumor so now i am calling it as a pseudo mix syndrome so if it is because if these symptoms are because of fibroma ovary then you are going to call it as mix syndrome if the same symptoms are causing by some other tumor other than fibroma ovary then it should be called as pseudo mix syndrome not mix pseudo mix so most common cause of this pseudo mix syndrome is brenner's tumor so we have discussed all the important points regarding serous tumors mucinous tumors and brenner tumor after brenner tumor let's continue with the two other tumors which are endometroid tumors and clear cell tumors are they part of epithelial cell cancers yes please concentrate here now we have completed serous tumors mucinous tumors brenner's is also completed now we are going to discuss about endometroid tumor and clear cell tumor now these are very simple now please concentrate that endometroid tumor and clear cell cancer both of them they are malignant tumors okay they are malignant okay they are mostly malignant in nature now in the name itself it's very clear endometroid tumor so it is associated with endometriosis say associated with endometriosis and endometrial cancer but if they ask you in a single line question most common ovarian tumor which is associated with endometrial cancer then the better answer would be endometroid ovarian tumors endometroid ovarian tumors are mostly are most commonly associated with endometrial cancer then what about what is the ovarian tumor what is the ovarian tumor 
most common ovarian tumor which is associated with endometriosis not the endometrial cancer if it is endometrial cancer it is endometroid tumor if they are asking you what is the ovarian tumor most commonly associated with endometriosis please concentrate here associated with endometriosis most common ovarian tumor associated with endometriosis the better answer will be clear cell tumor most common ovarian tumor associated with endometrial cancer endometrioid tumors most common ovarian tumor associated with endometriosis the better answer will be clear cell tumor but also remember both this endo endometrioid tumor and clear cell tumor they are both associated with endometriosis as well as endometrial cancer but most common something different okay so both are malignant in potential now this clear cell tumors they are associated with in utero exposure to diethyl silvestrol okay taking this drug during pregnancy that can cause clear cell tumors okay so in utero exposure to diethyl silvestrol can cause this ovarian tumors in the offspring now here on histopathology you can see hobnail cells and these hobnail cells can be seen in other places also we'll discuss don't worry when we are discussing about the germ cell tumors sex cord stromal tumors there we will discuss so here on histopath you can see hobnail cells and this clear cell tumors are rarely rarely associated with paraneoplastic hypercalcemia okay they are associated with paraneoplastic hypercalcemia now which tumors are associated with pseudomyxoma peritoneae mucinous tumors there i missed one point please concentrate they are associated with pseudomyxoma peritoneae leading to severe hypoproteinemia why there is severe hypoproteinemia in these patients why because mucin mucin is nothing but protein right mucin so mucin is present in a place where it's not supposed to be present mucin is present wherever it's needed okay wherever this mucosal lining or wherever this mucus is needed there it should be present not in the ovaries so if all this mucus is getting concentrated in a place where it is not needed so in the body where it is needed it is going down so it causes a hypoproteinemia see all this like no the ovaries got ruptured and all this mucin is getting poured into the abdomen where it's not needed it's in the third space so that's going to cause hypoproteinemia in the patient so pseudomyxoma peritonea is associated with the ovarian uh, mucinous ovarian tumors which causes the hypoproteinemia in the patient okay guys we have completed all the epithelial cell tumors which include serous tumors mucinous tumors brenner's tumor endometrioid tumor and clear cell tumor in the next part we are going to discuss about the sex cord stromal tumors as well as the germ cell tumors okay the germ cell tumors and sex cord stromal tumors we are going to discuss in the part 2 of the video thank you Welcome back, guys. Now, in this part two of ovarian tumors, let's discuss about the germ cell tumors. Guys, what are the examples of germ cell tumors? Guys, teratoma, dysgeminoma, yolk sac tumor, embryonal cancer, choriocarcinoma, and a mixed variant. Okay. So now, in this video, we are going to discuss about main important germ cell tumors. So let's go further. guys before going further let me tell you one point see usually ovarian cancers okay they are seen somewhere around 60 to 70 years of age okay usually ovarian cancers they are very rare and that too they are going to be seen in old age groups but do you know something this germ cell tumors they are going to be seen somewhere around 10 to 30 years of age so presents very early early in onset so germ cell tumors they presents very much early and very important point to be noted here is that see these germ cell cancers and there are certain tumor markers okay why am see tumors will be having tumor markers that's something normal but for exams they will be asking you they will be asking you something like hcg is the tumor marker of okay something like that ldh is the main tumor marker of something like that so let's go further So, what is the first germ cell tumor, guys? The first germ cell tumor is teratoma. We have seen teratoma, but here 
there is no such thing as teratoma why because the teratomas do not have tumor markers having said that what's the second tumor guys after teratoma as there is no tumor marker let's go with the disgerminoma so what are the tumor markers of disgerminoma i used to remember something like that d for d d l d d l d h something like that okay so disgerminoma the main tumor marker is l d h but also here you can have hcg and plap placental alkaline phosphatase okay something like that plap placental alkaline phosphatase but the main important marker is disgerminoma d l d h so ldh lactate dehydrogenase is a main important tumor marker guys here itself i just want to put something in your mind hcg is seen everywhere all germ cell tumors have this hcg you can see here hcg is here hcg hcg but hcg is not seen with yolk sac tumor so hcg is the one tumor marker which is not seen with the yolk sac tumor but the hcg is seen with disgerminoma embryonal cancer choriocarcinoma this is something very much important again i will show you don't worry now after disgerminoma let's talk about the yolk sac tumor if i am talking about the yolk sac where do you expect yolk sac to be yolk sac somewhere in the fetus can i say something like that yolk sac do you have yolk sac no fetus yes so yolk sac fetus that's the first thing that's going to come to my mind alpha fetus protein alpha feto protein so the main tumor marker is alpha feto protein and you can also see the lactate dehydrogenase and alpha 1 antitrypsin but the main is alpha feto protein but fetus before stage embryo embryo fetus and all the, i think they are all the same kind of category so in embryonal cancer also i'm saying it is alpha feto protein embryo fetus yolk sac fetus so yolk sac tumors alpha feto protein embryonal cancers alpha feto protein i have already said you that hcg is present everywhere except yolk sac tumors now choriocarcinoma if i am saying choriocarcinoma chorion means placenta we all know that placenta is associated with the production of hcg beta hcg so choriocarcinoma simple hcg and i have also said you hcg is everywhere simply you can say choriocarcinoma hcg is a tumor marker so these are very very important points so different types of germ cell tumors which are associated with different tumor markers again i am repeating disgerminoma ldh yolk sac tumor alpha feto protein the main important tumor marker after that embryonal cancer embryo same fetus alpha feto protein choriocarcinoma it is hcg now important point is teratoma please concept please understand here okay teratoma it is not associated with any tumor marker no tumor marker ldh see these are some important exceptions ldh can be seen in all germ cell tumors it can be seen with all germ cell tumors to certain extent okay to certain extent but mainly ldh is the tumor marker of disgerminoma we know that but ldh is not seen with choriocarcinoma and embryonal cancer okay so ldh is a main marker of disgerminoma but it is seen with most of the germ cell tumors but this is not seen with the choriocarcinoma and embryonal cancer important mcq you have to buy her this now alpha feto protein alpha feto protein seen in all the germ cell tumors to, to certain extent but it is not seen with the choriocarcinoma and disgerminoma okay see in disgerminoma there is no alpha feto protein and in choriocarcinoma also there is no alpha feto protein so usually alpha feto protein it is seen where in yolk sac tumors embryonal cancer i have already said this hcg it is seen with all the germ cell tumors except yolk sac tumor seen yolk sac tumor there is no hcg here here hcg is there here hcg is there here hcg is there but there is no hcg over here very important mcq okay so after seeing this let's start with the individual germ cell tumor so what is our individual germ cell tumor guys so first thing is teratoma now this teratomas can be benign in nature it can be malignant in nature see i am talking about the benign teratoma the benign teratoma should be called as the mature cystic teratoma or dermoid cyst so what exactly is this dermoid cyst dermoid cyst is nothing but 
a benign teratoma which can also be called as mature cystic teratoma mature is something good but immature immature fellows they are dangerous so immature immature please concentrate immature cystic teratoma is malignant okay malignant is the most common germ cell cancer see i am using the word cancer cancer means malignant please remember the first germ cell tumor which we are going to discuss right now it is dermoid cyst so dermoid cyst is the most common germ cell tumor most common germ cell tumor no doubt and that too dermoid cyst is a benign tumor okay so it's a benign in nature but if i am talking about immature cystic teratoma then it is a malignant and if someone ask you what is the most common malignant germ cell tumor malignant germ cell cancer it is immature cystic teratoma let me just uh, have a recap okay let let me just ask you some questions what is the most common ovarian tumor most common ovarian tumor serous cystadenoma epithelial cell tumor serous cystadenoma what is the most common ovarian cancer serous cystadenocarcinoma something like that the same way please remember here most common ovarian tumor of reproductive age see it's very much important most common ovarian tumor of reproductive age is not serous cystadenoma here it is dermoid cyst okay reproductive age most commonly it is serous cystadenoma most common ovarian tumor serous cystadenoma most common ovarian cancer serous cystadenocarcinoma but if they ask you what is the most common ovarian tumor of reproductive age it is dermoid cyst okay most common ovarian tumor during pregnancy dermoid cyst most common ovarian tumor to undergo torsion dermoid cyst or mature cystic teratoma see on my top you can see this dermoid cyst you can see this hairs inside the dermoid cyst you can see all these hairs so why all these hairs are present and sometimes you can see a teeth also teeth what i'm trying to put into your mind is this dermoid cyst or this dermoid tumor this ovarian tumor contains it contains three components of the germ cell layers okay germ layers ectoderm endoderm mesoderm that there no so all the three components of the germ cell layers are present in which ovarian tumors it is dermoid cyst see endodermal components like bone and teeth can be seen mesodermal components like sebaceous secretions can be seen and ectodermal components like you know most common components like hair and endocrine glands are seen so these dermoid cysts are the ovarian tumors which contains all the components of the three germ layers again i am repeating these are the tumors most common ovarian tumors to undergo torsion most common ovarian tumors of pregnancy and most common ovarian tumors in the reproductive age group which is very much important to be kept in mind after that see again try to understand this is not something more common see if someone ask you most common ovarian cancer during pregnancy most common ovarian cancer during pregnancy are you going to answer dermoid cyst no why because dermoid cyst itself is a benign in nature so most common ovarian tumor of pregnancy then what is most common ovarian cancer of pregnancy that we will see in the next slide don't worry so most common ovarian tumor of reproductive age most common uh, ovarian tumor during pregnancy and most common ovarian tumor to undergo torsion all of them are dermoid cyst now let's see these dermoid cysts we have already seen that they are benign in nature they are benign in nature but they may change into cancers they may change into cancers what is the risk almost 0.2 to 2% chance as that these dermoid cysts may turn into cancers true and what is the most common site for the malignancy what is the most common site where this a uh, dermoid cyst is turning into cancer in this dermoid cyst there is a region which is highlighted in this yellow dotted line that is known as rokitansky protuberance this rokitansky protuberance is the area where more likely the malignant transformation is uh, happening so please keep this point in mind and the malignant transformation if there is a malignant transformation see if there is a malignant transformation then the 
cancer which is going to arise is the squamous cell carcinoma okay if there is a cancer then the cancer will be squamous cell carcinoma of the ovary okay that's something important point to keep in mind now see the moment i think about the demoid stage the mnemonic which comes to my mind is a road trip road trip r o a d t r i p r o a d t r i p trip road trip why why because see this r o just reminds me about the rukitansky protuberance the most common site for the malignancy to occur and this tri trip t r i this tri represents me the tri components okay the three germ layers are going to be present in this dermoid cyst again dermoid cyst is benign okay and again t will specifically mention me this t mentions me about the torsion why because this is the tumor which most commonly undergoes torsion ovarian tumor to undergo torsion dermoid cyst t and r r will again separately remind me this is the most common ovarian tumor in a reproductive age women and p p separately remind me that this is the ovarian tumor most common ovarian tumor during pregnancy so this is all a sum up about the dermoid cyst which is a benign tumor malignant will be called as immature cystic teratoma which is the most common germ cell cancer okay most common germ cell cancer not overall most common cancer overall most common cancer is serous cystic adeno carcinoma which is a epithelial ovarian tumor but in germ cell tumors the most common germ cell cancer or the most common malignancies in the germ cell tumors is immature cystic teratoma okay now let's discuss about the ultrasonographic findings in a dermoid cyst ultrasonographic findings what you will see in ultrasonography see the most common the most common appearance is a dermoid plug is a dermoid plug or ovarian dermoid what exactly is this see if i am doing ultrasonography you can see an area which is just protruding something like this okay protruding into the cyst see all this is the cystic space and into the cystic space there is a protuberance so this is known as the dermoid plug okay so what what exactly is this protuberance it is rukitansky's protuberance okay rukitansky's protuberance so that's the most common ultrasonographic finding so what is the most common ultrasonographic finding it is a dermoid plug because of this rukitansky nodule and second most common appearance is a tip of the iceberg sign so what exactly is this tip of the iceberg sign see if this ovarian dermoid if it's having this hyper like you know ecogenic areas uh, ecogenic substances like the serum teeth and all that hair and stuff see because of this ecogenic areas it's going to create a shadow which will mask the tumor which will mask the cyst so only certain part of the cyst is visible so if there are ecogenic contents inside the tumor that ecogenic contents will create a shadow that shadow will mask most of the tumor so that only you can see some part of tumor in an iceberg see only whatever you are seeing in an iceberg is a very small part see there is something very much deep inside inside the water which you are not able to see in the same way in the ultrasonography you can only see some part of the cyst because most of the cyst is getting shadowed by ecogenic areas so that will give tip of the iceberg sign which is very very important they will ask you tip of the iceberg sign dermoid cyst dermoid plug same with dermoid cyst and along with that along with that there can be dot dash pattern see what exactly is this dot dash pattern dot dash pattern is ultrasonographic finding seen in a patient who is having this uh, a dermoid cyst because of this floating hairs the floating hairs will cause these kind of a dotted dash pattern you see you can see this all this dotted dashes okay so these dotted dashes are because of hairs which are floating inside the cyst so what are the ultrasonographic findings which you can see in a patient with this dermoid cyst guys dermoid plug tip of the iceberg sign dotted dash appearance okay something very much important for the exams after this mature cystic teratoma which is dermoid cyst now let's continue with the dysgerminoma okay just wait before dysgerminoma now let's see what is the management of dermoid cyst now if there is this dermoid cyst what we can do simple cystectomy 
okay simple cystectomy can be done if family is not completed what if family is completed now why we are doing oophorectomy means removing the ovaries okay removing the ovaries if the family is completed it is shown that we have to do the oophorectomy why why because there is some malignant potential that this dermoid cyst may turn into cancer there is almost 0 0.2 to 2% risk of malignancy is there so if the family is completed if the family is completed then go with the oophorectomy if family is not completed just do the cystectomy so that's the management for the dermoid cyst now let's talk about the dysgerminoma this dysgerminoma is a fleshy tumor fleshy lobulated tumor now what's the most common germ cell tumor most common germ cell tumor is dermoid cyst now this is the second most common germ cell tumor which is a fleshy lobulated with this creamy color now important points which you have to keep in mind here are it's a ovarian counterpart for the seminoma see this dysgerminoma is called as a known to be a ovarian counterpart for testicular seminoma what does that mean by it's the same kind of histopathological appearance the seminoma cells are more similar to the cells which are seen in dysgerminoma so histopathologically they are almost similar so in a man it is called a seminoma in a female it is dysgerminoma and dysgerminomas are the most common ovarian cancers in this genetic gonads in a dysgenetic gonads where the gonads have not pro not properly formed in a dysgenetic gonads are the gonads which were like totally inside the abdomen okay they are not descending down in that undescended gonads if they turn into cancer they are going to turn into dysgerminoma so it's the most common cancer of dysgenetic gonads and see this is the thing which i have said you ovarian dermoid or dermoid cyst dermoid cyst is the most common ovarian tumor of pregnancy true but if they ask you most common ovarian cancer of pregnancy most common ovarian cancer of pregnancy then it is not the dermoid cyst then the answer will be dysgerminoma so most common ovarian cancer of pregnancy most of the time this dysgerminoma is a unilateral it's unilateral but sometimes it can be bilateral now if i ask you what is the tumor epithelial ovarian cell tumor which is 100% unilateral 100% unilateral it's brenner rubbery consistency solid in nature rubbery nature like you know it just feels like a rubber solid consistency bus in the nest walthard cell nest that's a brenner 100% unilateral okay now why i am repeating you know there is one more germ cell tumor which we are going to discuss later in the next slide that's also 100% unilateral what is the next germ cell tumor after dysgerminoma first is dermoid cyst teratoma second one is dysgerminoma the third one is yolk sac tumor yolk sac tumor yes yolk sac tumors are 100% unilateral in nature okay we'll discuss later don't worry now this dysgerminomas they are mostly unilateral mostly unilateral but not 100% unilateral they are mostly unilateral but sometimes they can be bilateral also and this dysgerminoma are the only germ cell tumors which are radio sensitive in nature which means they are like highly sensitive to radiation if they are highly sensitive to radiation you can easily destroy these tumors if you can easily destroy them if you can easily kill these cancers that will be having good prognosis so prognosis is very much good so best prognosis among all gcts because they are highly radio sensitive okay now so what are the hpv hpe findings histopathological findings what you can see is the nests of cells you can see at the nests of cells which are surrounded by the thick septa here also you can see the nests of cells which are surrounded by this thick septa okay guys walthard cell nest walthard cell nest is seen in brenner's with a coffee bean nuclei okay coffee bean nuclei here the cells like you know the nests of the tumor cells which are separated by a thick septa if they ask you this exact like you no know, terminology is important nests of cells separated by fibrous septa seen in a dysgerminoma walthard cell nest brenner's tumor tumor marker what is a tumor marker of dysgerminoma 
So what is the main tumor marker guys? Dysgerminoma D, L, D, L. So lactate dehydrogenase is the main important tumor marker. But you can also find HCG and PLAP can also be seen. Okay, well and good. So we have seen all the important points about the dysgerminoma. Now let's go further with the yolk sac tumor. See this yolk sac tumor can also be called as endodermal sinus tumor. Important point is it's the worst tumor. It's the most malignant out of all the out of all the germ cell tumors. What are the germ cell tumors? Dermoid cyst. Like you know, dermoid cyst is benign. Dermoid cyst is benign. That immature teratomas are there. No immature teratomas, uh, dysgerminoma, this yolk sac tumor, embryonal cancer, out of choriocarcinoma. Of all these germ cell tumors, the worst guy is this yolk sac tumor. So, what is the tumor marker of yolk sac tumor? Yolk sac fetus. So, alpha fetoprotein. Yes, the tumor marker is alpha fetoprotein, the main tumor marker. It's the most malignant germ cell tumor. If it's the most malignant germ cell tumor, so definitely this would be having the worst prognosis. So, it is having 100 post like you know, it's having worst prognosis and the before slide itself I have said you that the germ cell tumor which is a hundred percent unilateral is yolk sac tumor epithelial ovarian tumor which are hundred percent unilateral are Brenner's Walthard cell nest coffee bean nuclei I'm repeating why because you know these are the points to be noted now see grossly this tumor just looks like uh, like yellowish in color Okay, fleshy yellowish in color and you can see some hemorrhagic areas which why because this tumor is a friable in nature like you know very much delicate in nature. So, it's a friable and yellow in color. Now, it's a most rapidly progressing tumor. So, that's the reason why it's more malignant. It's most rapidly progressing. More malignancy, worst prognosis. So, what is the germ cell tumor which is having the very good prognosis? Just before one dysgerminoma. Why? Because it's highly radi radio sensitive tumor. Now, this is highly malignant, worst prognosis. Now, HP, like your know, HP findings, histopathological findings. Now, if you do histopathological examination, there you are going to see Schiller dual bodies or glomeruloid body. What is the Schiller dual bodies? Schiller dual bodies are nothing but there is a central capillary. You can see there is a central capillary which are surrounded by the tumor cells. See, there is a central capillary which are surrounded by the tumor cells. And these tumor cells, in turn, they are separated by a space, cystic space. So, what exactly are these glomeruloid bodies? This, why they are called as glomeruloid bodies first? Why? Because they just looks like a glomerulus. So, glomeruloid body or Schiller dual bodies are nothing but a central capillary surrounded by the tumor cells, in turn surrounded by the cystic space. So, they are called as Schuller dual bodies which are seen with the yolk sac tumor and the main important tumor marker is alpha fetoprotein but you can also see LDH and alpha 1 fetoprotein but beta HCG is not seen here okay so we have completed the important germ cell tumors in the part 3 of the video let's discuss about the sex card stromal tumors and metastatic tumors of the ovary thank you Welcome back students. Now, in this video, let's continue with the sex cord stromal tumors. We have already completed epithelial ovarian tumors and germ cell tumors. Now, sex cord stromal tumors, they are mainly divided into sex cord tumors and stromal tumors. Please concentrate here. The sex cord tumors, they are further divided into estrogen secreting tumors where the tumor cells are producing estrogen. And one such example is granulosa cell tumor. Androgen secreting tumors where the tumor types are producing the androgens which includes serotonin cell tumor, leydig cell tumor and hyla cell tumors. So what we can know here that the sex cord tumors are divided into two different types based on the type of hormone it is producing the androgen secreting and estrogen secreting granulosa cell tumor is an example of estrogen secreting tumor. And serotonin leydig cell tumor is an example of androgen secreting tumor. 
Now, if you are talking about stromal tumors, it includes fibroma, thecoma, and fibrothecoma. Now, let's discuss in detail. If I am talking about the granulosa cell tumors, we all know that the granulosa cells they are associated with the estrogen production. So, just think basically in a granulosa cell tumor, if there is too much amount of estrogen production, so all the complications which a female is going to get, they are because of this hyper estrogenic state. What does I mean by? We know that estrogens are helping for endometrial proliferation. So, if there is too much amount of this estrogens that cause too much amount of endometrial proliferation. If there is too much amount of endometrium that can cause too much amount of menses. So, there will be menorrhagia associated. Okay, something like that. Okay, so this is the whole concept. If there is too much amount of estrogen, all the symptoms are because of this hyperestrogenism. Okay, so why this granulosa cell tumor? So, before going in detail about the granulosa cell tumor, know that this granulosa cell tumor is the most common, it's the most common sex card stromal malignancy. After that, why? Why this granulosa cell tumor? Very important MCQ, it's because of mutation in a gene known as FOXL2 gene mutation. Okay, well and good. Now, it is associated with the secretion of estrogen mainly and but can also progesterone. Okay, well and good. Now, see this granulosa cell tumor, it can be seen in an adult or it can be seen in a children. If it is present in adult, in adult subtype, what are the symptoms that a female is going to have? Very simple, I have already said, too much amount of estrogens, too much amount of endometrial proliferation and that too much amount of endometrial proliferation is associated with menstrual irregularities like menorrhagia, abnormal uterine bleeding, breast tenderness why there is breast tenderness we know that estrogens are acting on the breast tissue for the proliferation if there is too much amount of this endometrium that can cause breast tenderness okay it can be associated with the postmenopausal bleeding and endometrial hypoplasia and endometrial cancer see estrogens helping in endometrial proliferation good if there is too much amount of estrogens that can cause endometrial hyperproliferation. So, that is endometrial hyperplasia. We all know that endometrial hyperplasia is a pre-malignant condition for endometrial cancer. So, if there is too much amount of estrogens and this too much amount of estrogens can cause endometrial hyperplasia that any time can convert into endometrial cancer. Okay, so a female with a granulosa cell tumor it is at a risk of developing the endometrial cancer. So what we should do? As she is having this high risk, we have to do the endometrial sampling. So this is a screening we are doing. So endometrial sampling should be done for all females with a granulosa cell tumor. Why? Why? Because they are at a risk of getting, getting this endometrial cancer. Now, let's talk about the juvenile subtype. So, what is this juvenile subtype? The same granulosa cell tumor, if it's happening in a small child, it's a juvenile subtype. So, how they are going to present? It's a granulosa cell tumor. It's producing too much amount of estrogens. We all know that too much amount of estrogens can cause breast development. So, there will be precautious puberty. A female is going to present with the, a precautious puberty, especially if, if she is a child, she is going to present with the Precautious puberty. Okay. See here, the small child, like she is having abnormal a breast development. For her age, for her age, there shouldn't be that much amount of breast. So, in a juvenile subtype, she is going to present with a precautious puberty. And on histopathology, on histopathology, you can see this call exina bodies. See, what are these call exina bodies? See, call exina bodies are nothing but the granulosa cells. See, these granulosa cells, they are arranged around eosinophilic secretion. See, there is a central eosinophilic secretion around which the granulosa cells are concentrically arranged. So, granulosa cells arranged in clusters surrounding a central cavity of eosinophilic secretions and these granulosa cells or these tumor cells is also having a coffee bean nuclei. So, important point. We have already seen that a coffee bean nuclei is also associated with the Brenner's. There we have already seen and I am also saying that coffee bean nuclei is also mainly associated with the granulosa cell tumors. 
call x in our bodies where there is arrangement of this tumor cells around the eosinophilic secretion looking like a primordial follicle okay so these are the call x in our bodies which are seen on the histopathology now what the tumor marker is important so the granulosa cell tumor marker is inhibin and anti mullerian hormone so these are all the important points about the granulosa cell tumor which is a most common sex card stromal malignancy after this let's talk about the androgen secreting tumors which are serotonin leading cell tumors what are the important points to keep in mind we all know that it's a androgen secreting tumor so if it's androgen secreting tumor in a female what it will do too much amount of androgens will cause hirsutism and so much amount of androgens cause a more a more drastic changes more severe changes like even virilization so let's see serotonin leading cell tumors usually they are benign in nature and rare tumors they secrete androgens we have already seen that but rarely they can secrete estrogens but that's very rare now the age group which is affected is 30 to 40 years of age on histopathology you can see a seminiferous like tubules with rinke crystals okay see in this histopathological slide you can see all these crystals see these crystals are especially seen in the leading cell tumors okay these, these are the rinke crystals okay which are made up of a 3 beta hydroxy steroid dehydrogen that and all not needed important point is on histopathology rinke crystals are seen with serotonin leading cell tumors they produce androgens okay so these tumors produce androgens and because of this hyperandrogenic state there can be hirsutism which is mild okay so what you are going to have in hirsutism that's male pattern baldness can be there abnormal facial hair can be there a male pattern baldness and even you can have acne okay this is okay but more severe changes more permanent changes see this virilization it's a permanent change okay it's a permanent change what and all you are going to have in the virilization so these are the permanent changes which include the clitoral enlargement a breast atrophy and a deepening of the voice so these and all are the more severe changes which are seen with the virilization now important point you have to keep in mind is see when we are discussing pcos there we have studied that pcos is the most common cause of hirsutism okay pcos there is no doubt pcos polycystic ovarian syndrome is the most common cause of hirsutism okay why because there also there is too much amount of androgens and that androgens can cause this kind of uh, facial hair acne that and all okay well and good but remember hirsutism because of pcos it is adult onset and insidious in onset this is the important point insidious in onset which means it's very much gradual it's just not like a very much rapid it's not rapid onset hirsutism it's gradually gradually slowly 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 takes a lot of time to have this kind of hirsutism features so hirsutism in pcos it's a gradual insidious onset but if a female if she is having a ovarian tumor or adrenal tumor these tumors are pouring lots and lots of androgens and this so much amount of androgens at a time can cause rapid onset hirsutism so important point to be noted here is rapid onset hirsutism is seen with the ovarian or adrenal tumors in serious onset adult onset is seen with the pcos and pcos i am again repeating it's a most common cause of hirsutism rinke crystals serotonin ovarian cell tumor okay now let's continue with the fibroma now here in fibroma we have already discussed when we are discussing about the brenner's tumor we have discussed something like a brenner's is associated with the pseudomix syndrome there i have said mix syndrome is associated with fibroma okay so let's see usually these fibromas they are benign in nature and mostly they are unilateral tumors see here in this female you can see that only one ovary is getting affected unilateral tumors and benign in nature now on histopathology you can see a fibroblasts okay so fibroma fibroblast there is this is so much amount of a fibroblast which can be seen in this tumor 
okay so well and good now it is associated with the mix syndrome what does i mean by see mix syndrome is nothing but a condition of a plural effusion and ascites due to a benign tumor and that to fibroma of the ovary see in this female you can see there is this ascites okay this yellow color fluid which is getting accumulated in the abdomen that's the ascites and even here in her lung you can see the pleural effusion so because of a fibroma if a female is developing pleural effusion and ascites then you should call it as a mix syndrome and the mix syndrome is because of this fibroma there is no doubt okay so these are the important points you have to keep in mind regarding fibroma ovary now let's continue with the krukenberg tumor see what exactly is this krukenberg tumor please concentrate guys krukenberg tumor is an example of a metastatic tumor what does i mean by See, Krukenberg tumor is not a primary ovarian tumor. It's not a primary ovarian cancer. See, this cancer have originated somewhere in the body, maybe in the GIT, maybe in the breast. From these places, the tumor cells got metastasized to the ovary and there in the ovary, they are getting proliferated. So, I can clearly say that Krukenberg tumor is an example of a secondary ovarian tumor. Are secondary ovarian cancers okay now so what is the most common site from which this Krukenberg tumor is getting metastasized it's the gastric cancer okay so gastric cancer is the most common cause our gastric cancer will metastasize to the ovaries and there it can proliferate as a Krukenberg tumor so metastatic spread is most commonly from the gastric mucosa followed by a breast also remember that this cancer is spreading from the stomach okay from the stomach it's coming to the ovaries via retrograde lymphatics okay still it's debated we are not very much sure but this is the best answer you can keep so retrograde lymphatics are the root for the spread of this krukenberg tumor from the stomach to the ovaries Often these tumors are bilateral in nature. See, you can see both the ovaries are affected. Mostly it's bilateral. Okay, often bilateral. But the important point here to be noted is these tumors they are symmetrical mostly, and the ovaries retain their ovaries retain their shape and the capsule is intact. Okay, there is no rupture of the capsule and ovaries retain their shape so this is a very very important point the tumor is mostly waxy in nature okay waxy consistency waxy nature and important points are they are symmetrical ovaries retain their shape and the capsule around the ovary is intact it's not ruptured and the most common site for the metastasis is g okay gastric cancer now if you do the biopsy and if you see on histopathology you can see the tumor cells you can see the tumor cells which are mainly filled with the vacuole which contains mucin okay so a tumor cell have a vacuole which contains mucin and this vacuole is kicking the nucleus to the periphery okay the nucleus is going to come to the a periphery so it just looks like a ring so signet ring cells okay on histopathology you can see signet ring cells okay so signet ring cells are seen with the krukenberg tumor you can see here okay these and all are the signet ring cells after seeing the krukenberg tumor let's continue with the surgical staging guys we have discussed the epithelial cell tumors, we have seen the germ cell tumors, six cord stromal tumors, metastatic tumors. Okay, well and good. All different types of ovarian tumors we have completed. Now, what is this surgical staging? The staging of the ovarian cancer is done not clinically but via surgically. What does I mean by? If a female have some symptoms, now she came to us, now we have like you know diagnosed that she is having this ovarian cancer 
First what we will do is the surgery. After doing surgery, we are going to remove her uterus and ovaries. That's a total abdominal hysterectomy and bilateral salping ovaphorectomy. First surgery. After doing surgery, we are going to send these contents. Okay, what and all we have removed. We are going to send it to the PATH lab. The pathologist, he is going to examine and he will be giving you the staging. So, first surgery followed by staging. So, we are not doing the surgery based on the staging. First we will do the surgery, later we will do the staging. So this is the surgical staging. Now a female came, you, like you know, we have started the surgery. What we are going to do? We are going to give a midline incision. Okay, we are going to do the laparotomy. We are going to cut open the abdomen, midline incision. Now, if you see there is ascites. Okay, if you find that there is this ascites, what we are going to do? We are going to collect this ascitic fluid we are going to send it to the path lab for cytology just for to know whether this ovarian tumor if it is spilling some of the cells microscopic cells into this ascitic fluid so that there might be microscopic deposit so to know whether there is a microscopic metastasis or whether this tumor cell is getting like you know getting entered into the this um, ascitic fluid what we are going to do is collect this ascitic fluid send it for the cytology that's what we are going to do if there is no if there is no ascites what we have to do is just create an environment which just looks like ascites means you have to do a peritoneal washing okay so all this peritoneal pouches you just do a saline washing and collect this fluid you have to do okay you have to put the saline fluid and you have to uh, like you know wash this peritoneal pouches and you have to collect the saline and send it for the cytology just to know whether there is any microscopic small small cells which are present already outside the ovary right because there is no gross appearance you just want to know whether there is any microscopic spread or not so for that after midline incision if there is ascitic fluid collect that ascitic fluid or if there is no ascites you just wash them and collect this fluid and send for the cytology okay well and good now assess the uh, pelvic and abdominal organs what does i mean by you just look at like you know the gross morphology of the ovaries how they have affected is there is any peritoneum affected is there is any small metastasis happening onto the liver or there is any uh, these deposits which are present onto the diaphragm or omentum so what you are doing is assessing all the pelvic organs you are just checking what and all the organs have affected is the tumor just lying to the ovaries or is there is any gross deposits okay now that you are going to do after that what you will be doing is you will be performing total abdominal hysterectomy with bilateral salping or ophorectomy important point so this is what we are doing for the ovarian cancer if someone asks you what is the treatment that will be doing for the ovarian cancer that's total abdominal hysterectomy along with the bilateral salping or ophorectomy now after that you have to do the infracolic omentectomy why you just want to do the infracolic omentectomy because see there is no gross pathology it's just looking like the only ovaries are affected only ovaries are affected now you don't know whether the tumor cells have already been metastasized to the organs pelvic organs so what you will do is you have to collect the samples See, you cannot do something like collecting all the samples from omentum, liver, or like in you know, peritoneum. You can't collect many, many, many samples. So what you have to do is at least take a sample which is going to be most commonly affected. That is omentum. So you have to do infracolic omentectomy to know whether there is any micrometastasis or not. And also do a peritoneal biopsy. This and all we are doing. See, this infracolic omentectomy, peritoneal biopsy, ascitic wash, okay, ascitic fluid collection for cytology, all this we are doing to know whether is there is any presence of this micrometastasis happened or not. But just think logically. If you can see a very big lump of tumor on the capsule of liver, which means you can grossly see them. In that conditions, you no need to do this SIT fluid collection and sending for, for cytology. Why? Because you can grossly see that the tumor have already spread. So in that conditions, there is no need of all these things. If you can see a tumor deposit onto the diaphragm, if you can see a big tumor lump which is attached to the 
peritoneum in that conditions all these are not necessary but in that cases where you cannot see nothing only ovaries are affected you just want to know you just want to confirm that there is no micrometastasis so to confirm that we are doing this ascitic fluid collection we are doing this infracolic omentectomy to know whether there is this metastasis happened to omentum or not because that omentum is the most commonly going to be affected now you can also do the peritoneal biopsy along with that you have to do pelvic and paraiotic lymph node sampling to know whether there is this lymphatic spread or not like you know that lymph node involvement is there or not so we are going to do all this step and later we are going to know the staging of the ovarian cancer so what is the staging of the ovarian cancer guys it is a surgical staging important point okay now see in advanced stages in advanced stages optimal debulking should be done what does i mean by see optimal debulking it means that you are removing the tumor as much as you can for example see in this staging have i sh showed you have i like you know discussed that you have to remove a certain part of a liver have i discussed something like that no i haven't discussed why i am discussing right now see in advanced stages if i am talking about ovarian cancer stage 4 for example or ovarian cancer stage 3 it's a advanced stage of the cancer now it's advanced stage which means that already the abdominal organs are getting affected the liver is getting affected for example see if the liver capsule is affected now i have to remove that part of tumor which is affecting the liver along with some normal amount of liver tissue what i'm trying to put into your mind see here in surgical staging i haven't mentioned that but if you can grossly see them if you can grossly see this kind of deposits onto the peritoneum onto the diaphragm or onto the liver what you have to do is you have to try to remove them okay so optimal debulking means removing the tumor as much as you can okay you are removing all the tumor which you can see so that's optimal debulking it is done in advanced stages yes you have to do if you can see that you know you have to remove it okay but what if you you are seeing a tumor which is present on the diaphragm it's not able to you you cannot simply remove that tumor you can't simply uh, create a puncture in the diaphragm so in that case is well, because you know it's a major it's a muscle it's helping the respiration you can't simply put a hole into the diaphragm so in that case is what you can do is a suboptimal debulking so what you have to do ideally ideally you have to do the debulking but in that cases where you can't do debulking in that cases you can do suboptimal debulking okay so that is the important point you have to keep in mind all these are the important points about the surgical staging now after seeing the surgical staging let's talk about the stages of the ovarian cancer now it's very simple in stage 1 the tumor is localized to ovaries means ovaries are affected in stage 1 in stage 2 there is this pelvic extension means the tumor is extending to pelvic organs okay well and good in stage 3 the abdomen is getting affected first ovaries next pelvis next abdomen is getting affected and stage 4 it's the distant metastasis simple ovaries pelvic extension abdominal extension distant metastasis now let's see one by one in detail now if i am talking about stage 1 stage 1 was further divided into 1a 1b and 1c what is 1a simple only one ovary is affected tumor is limited to or one ovary and that to the capsule is intact 1b 1b both the ovaries are affected capsule is intact 1c the capsule is ruptured 1a only one ovary 1b both the ovaries but in 1a and 1b the capsule is intact 1c the capsule have ruptured see it can be 1a it can be 1b what does i mean by 1c whether there is involvement of one ovary or two ovaries doesn't matter the capsule is ruptured if once the capsule is ruptured you are going to 1c now here once see when the capsule is ruptured if it is 1c1 it is surgical spill what does i mean by you are performing the surgery you are performing the surgery and accidentally the capsule is ruptured and all the contents of this tumor all the contents of its cysts just spill into the pelvic cavity or abdominal cavity now this is surgical spill okay 
Now, if the capsule have ruptured before surgery, pre-operative rupture, then it is 1C2 or in 1C2, either you have to see the tumor growth on the surface, the capsule, you can see the surface growth. It is 1C2. 1C3 means the malignant cells in the ascites or peritoneal washings is coming positive. See, we have collected that ascitic fluid, right? Now, if this ascitic fluid, if it's coming like, you know, if the cytology is coming positive for the malignant cells, it is 1C3. So, this is all about the one stage 1. Stage 1, 1A, 1 ovary, 1B, 2 ovaries, 1C, capsule rupture, doesn't matter whether 1 ovary is affected or 2 ovaries are affected. 1C, capsule rupture, if it's 1C1, surgical spill, 1C2, pre-operative spilling, pre-operative rupture, 1C3, it's a malignant ascites, okay. Now, in stage 2, there is this pelvic extension. What does I mean by pelvic extension? Like it's spreading to the pelvis. In 2A, this 2 was divided into 2A and 2B. In 2A, the tumor is spreading to fallopian tubes or uterus. Okay, the tumor, if it's spreading to fallopian tubes and uterus, then it is 2A. In 2B, there is this extension of tumor to the pelvic organs like bladder and rectum. 2A, fallopian tubes and uterus. 2B, bladder and rectum are getting affected. So, stage 2 completed. In stage 3, we all know that abdominal organs are getting affected. So, in stage 3, which abdominal organs are getting affected? Let's see. Now, this stage 3 was very, very important and a little bit more complicated. 3 was divided to 3A, 3B and 3C. 3A, 3B, 3C. 3A was further divided into 3A1 and 3A2. Okay, well and good. Now, what's happening in 3A1? If the retroperitoneal lymph nodes are getting affected, once the lymph nodes, see, once the lymph nodes are getting affected, you are coming into stage 3. Which lymph nodes? Retroperitoneal lymph nodes. So, involvement of retroperitoneal lymph nodes is making the stage 3. In 3A1, retroperitoneal lymph nodes are affected. Again, this 3A1 was further divided into 3A11, 3A12. In 3A11, this retroperitoneal lymph node metastasis or the retroperitoneal lymph nodes, they are less than 10 mm in size. If the size is more than 10 mm, it becomes 3A12. Okay, 3A12. It's more than 10 mm. So, retroperitoneal lymph node involvement, stage 3A1. Now, in stage 3A2, there is a microscopic extra pelvic involvement. What does I mean by? See, microscopic cancer, you have taken the biopsies from peritoneum, you have taken the biopsies from, like, you know, omentum, you have taken the biopsies, like, you know, from uh, some part of liver, liver. Now, what it's coming is, there is a microscopic cancer present. See, you can't see grossly, okay, you can't see grossly, but there is a microscopic cells. These microscopic tumor cells are invading, have already metastasized into the peritoneum or into the omentum. Now, in 3B, 3A2, it's microscopic. In 3B and 3C, 3B and 3C, please concentrate. There is a macroscopic involvement. There is, like, you know, you can see grossly. Grossly, you can see that there is this tumor deposits. Okay, these tumor deposits are present. Grossly, you can see with the naked eye. Where they are present? They are present on the capsule of liver and spleen. Okay, on the capsule of liver and spleen, you can see these macroscopic deposits. So, what's the difference between 3B and 3C? The difference is, grossly you can see, but if it's small in size, Okay, less than 2 centimeters in size. If this tumor is less than 2 centimeters in size and that too it's present on the spleen or liver capsule, not the parenchyma. It's just the superficial involvement of the liver and spleen. Now it is 3B. If, the, if it's big in size, big enough, more than 2 centimeters, it is 3C. Okay, well and good. Now let's talk about the stage 4. Stage 4 is the distant metastasis where there is a pleural effusion with a positive cytology. Very, very important. Pleural effusion. Which stage of ovarian cancer? Stage 4. 
pleural effusion with the malignant cells in the like you know that effusion the fluid it's stage 4 of the ovarian cancer that too stage 4a now so what is stage 4b see stage 4b it's very important that if the superficial capsule if the su if there is superficial involvement of the liver there is only superficial or the capsular involvement of the liver it is 3b and 3c we have discussed but once if the tumor is getting inside the liver okay once if the tumor is get getting metastasized into the parenchyma of the liver or spleen then it is stage 4b where you can see the parenchymal parenchymal metastasis of spleen and liver and also a very very important mcq inguinal lymph nodes are getting affected involvement of retroperitoneal lymph nodes 3a1 stage 4 stage 4 is involvement of inguinal lymph nodes mcq very much important so this is all about the staging of ovarian cancer okay well and good see already we have done the treatment already treatment is done why because we have already removed ovaries and uterus okay ovaries and uterus is already removed if you can see something grossly for stage 3 and 4 we have already done the debulking so even before the staging we have done the treatment so now what we can do after staging based on staging like you know uh, and based on staging and based on the type of tumor whether it's a epithelial ovarian tumor germ cell tumor as a sex cord stromal tumor based on the type of tumor what we can do is post operative chemotherapy we can do see what we are doing here chemotherapy but not the radiotherapy why why because these ovarian tumors please note that the ovarian tumors are radio resistant except this gemonoma there also we have discussed this germinoma is the only uh, like you know ovarian tumor only germ cell ovarian tumor which is highly radio sensitive but rest of the ovarian tumors they are mostly radio resistant so we are not doing the radiotherapy here but what we are doing here is a chemotherapy now what type of chemotherapy it depends on the type of ovarian tumor if it is an epithelial cell tumor what we are going to do is we are going to give them Paslitaxel along with the platin group of drugs. Okay, Paslitaxel along with the platin group of drugs, which includes the carboplatin or cisplatin. Okay, so Paslitaxel, carboplatin or cisplatin, IV or intraperitoneally. Okay, either via IV route or intraperitoneal Paslitaxel and cisplatin for almost six cycles we have to give and all the stages all the stages should be given see all the stages of epithelial ovarian cancer should be given except stage 1a and 1b except stage 1a and 1b of epithelial ovarian cancer see the staging is same for all the ovarian cancers now except for stage 1a and 1b of epithelial ovarian cancers you can give this post operative chemotherapy for rest of all the stages okay so what we are giving paslitaxel along with the platin group of drugs which includes cisplatin carboplatin other than this you can also give cyclophosphamide adriamycin and a platin group of drugs but the best best treatment can be paslitaxel with the platin group of drugs this is something very much best okay this is the, this should be the best answer now for a germ cell tumor what we can give for a germ cell tumor we can give bep regime okay so what is this bep regime bep regime b includes the bleomycin etopicide and cisplatin okay bep b e p bleomycin etopicide and p for platin that's a cisplatin so these three drugs can be given for a, a germ cell tumor like a post operatively now this this should be given to all the stages of the germ cell tumors except okay it can be given to all the germ cell tumors except dysgerminoma stage 1 if it is dysgerminoma and that too if it is in stage 1 no need to give this beprege and immature teratoma okay immature cystic teratoma we have discussed that immature cystic teratoma is the most common germ cell malignancy okay uh, it's the most common germ cell malignancy we have already discussed that now for immature teratoma stage 1 grade 1 and dysgerminoma stage 1 except for these
for all the other germ cell tumors and for all the other stages you can give this beverage there is no doubt very much important now for a six card stromal tumor there is no need of there is no need of this post operative chemotherapy okay usually surgery is enough but in stage 3 and 4 stage 3 and 4 you can give a beverage okay important so this is all about the post operative chemotherapy simple if it is epithelial cell tumor paclitaxel platinum that's it iv or intraperitoneal all stages can be given except stage 1a and 1b if it is a germ cell tumor important point is beprezin bleomycin etopicide and platinum cisplatin all stages can be given except dysgenoma stage 1 and immature cystic teratoma stage 1 grade 1 Six card tumors no need, but if it's stage three or stage four, six card stromal malignancy, then you can go with the beprezin. Okay, so these are the important points about the post-operative chemotherapy. Now we have completed the ovarian cancer. Now I just want to take a few more minutes and let's discuss about the non-neoplastic cysts of the ovary. It's a they, in the name itself, it's very clear. They are the non-neoplastic cysts. What does I mean by? See. what we are going to discuss right now something like you no know, a follicular cyst corpus luteal cyst theca luteal cyst see they are simple they are simple fluid filled cavities they will come and they will resolve on their own even without any treatment even without any treatment most of the time they will resolve by themselves so they are functional ovarian cysts they are called as functional ovarian cysts why because they will simply resolve on their own and examples of this cysts are follicular cyst what does i mean by see there is an ovarian follicle usually a um, mature ovarian follicle it should rupture and there should be ovulation and that ova should be like you know a met with a sperm or it it can simply disintegrate and you know via menstruation it it should come what does i mean by there is this follicle it's growing 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 it should rupture and produce the ova now what if it's not getting rupture it's simply growing and accumulating the fluid that causes follicular cyst it's a follicle but it's forming a fluid filled cavity it's a follicular cyst same like that corpus luteum it should usually undergo disintegration what if it's not getting a disintegrated it's forming a fluid filled cavity so that's a corpus luteal cyst so what i'm trying to say is these are not that dangerous and they can easily resolve on their own okay so follicular cyst is the most common cyst of ovary Corpus luteal cyst is the cyst which undergoes rupture most commonly. Important MCQ: What is the ovarian cyst which undergoes rupture most commonly? It's the corpus luteal cyst. Now, theca luteal cyst usually seen in that conditions where there is increased beta hCG. So, the conditions where there is increased beta hCG, something like in the twin pregnancy or something like in the molar pregnancy. So, in these conditions, you can expect a theca luteal cyst. so important points are this note cyst when we are going to call it as a follicle and like you know what is the demarcation point to call it as a follicle and to call it as a cyst if a follicular size if a follicle size if it's getting more than 3 cm if a follicle size is getting more than 3 cm then onwards you should call it as a cyst okay and these are functional ovarian cysts and they will resolve on their own so examples are follicular cyst most common theca luteal cyst which is associated with the increased beta hcg and corpus luteal cyst which is the most common to rupture now i have repeated this point no need of any treatment but what if this cyst it's undergoing rupture or it's this cyst it's undergoing torsion and creating a lot of pain what if the cyst is increasing in size so much in that condition there are certain conditions where you have to surgically operate the cyst so let's see let's see what is the management management of a non neoplastic ovarian cyst first of all you don't need to do anything why because they resolve on their own but but if the cyst size is increasing more than 7 cm in a reproductive age women if the cyst size is increasing more than 7 cm do the surgery if the if there is this cyst in a postmenopausal age 
see post menopausal age they are at risk of developing this ovarian cancer so if there is this cyst in her ovaries and that too this female is a post menopausal woman now you should suspect that there is ovarian cancer might be developing in this female so what you have to do go with the markers so check the ca125 levels in a post menopausal woman if the levels are more than 35 international units go with the surgery so this is all about the post menopausal woman what if there is a cyst there is a cyst in a pre pubertal age we have already seen that 10 to 30 years age group the most common ovarian cancer is going to be germ cell tumors okay germ cell tumors so if there is a cyst in pre pubertal age something like in a 10 years this might be a dermoid cyst or this might be a dysgerminoma or this might be a yolk sac tumor chorio carcinoma embryonal cancer so just think about the germ cell tumors and go with the markers which are suggesting the germ cell tumors here you are not going to check the ca125 levels see in a pre pubertal age this is the golden point in a pre pubertal age ca125 levels are not significant even the reproductive age ca125 levels are not significant why because the ca125 levels are going to be raised in many benign conditions something like a fibroid of the uterus okay uterine fibroids are associated okay let me show you here uterine fibroids are associated with increase ca125 levels and endometriosis endo a metriosis is associated with increase ca125 levels or uterine tb is associated with ca125 levels so in a pre pubertal age group ca125 levels are not significant in a pre pubertal age group you have to think about a germ cell cancer so for the germ cell cancer what are the tumor markers ldh alpha fetoprotein beta hcg so in a pre pubertal age you have to check for ldh levels alpha fetoprotein levels and hcg levels and if they are high you are going to do the surgery accordingly okay so this is what you are going to do now symptomatic cyst during pregnancy what if there is this cyst during the pregnancy and that to this cyst is symptomatic symptomatic in a sense maybe there is too much amount of pain because of the rupture of the cyst or maybe due to the torsion of the cyst so in this conditions you have to immediately do the surgery so get okay, regardless of the gestational age regardless it doesn't matter in which trimester she is whether she is in first trimester second trimester or third trimester it doesn't matter if she is having symptoms because of this cyst do the surgery now what if it's a asymptomatic cyst asymptomatic cyst and that too it's a small cyst if it is asymptomatic during pregnancy there is no need of any treatment no need no need of any treatment if it is symptomatic regardless of the gestational age do the surgery perform surgery and do the remove the cyst okay now what if this is special condition what if there is this asymptomatic cyst but it's a large cyst a symptomatic large cyst greater than 10 cm in size now in this condition what you should do now in the conditions like this you have to like you know uh, do it depend on the trimester this is a large cyst it's growing now if you have found it in first trimester you have found that this cyst in the first trimester now what you have to do don't do anything why because first trimester is very, very much crucial because of all this organogenesis happening so first trimester don't do anything just do wait and watch okay if you have found this large asymptomatic cyst in the first trimester don't do anything wait and watch then what we have to do remove this large cyst okay remove this large cyst in the second trimester okay plan the surgery in the second trimester okay well and good what if you have seen this large asymptomatic cyst in the third trimester you have found this in the third in the third trimester what you have to do now here if you are planning this is already third trimester if you are planning to go for a cesarean section now while doing the cesarean section like you know, after the delivery of the baby even remove this cyst if you are planning for the cesarean section remove the cyst also at the time of cesarean section okay so remove it during delivery if lscs is planned if you have planned this remove it along with the delivery 
what if she is going through the normal vaginal delivery after delivery post delivery 6 weeks means post delivery you have to wait for 6 weeks and you have to remove the cyst it's very simple if you have found the large symptomatic cyst in the third trimester either you can remove it while doing c section or plan it 6 weeks after the delivery okay remove the cyst after 6 weeks so this is all about the management of non neoplastic ovarian cysts so with this we have totally completed the topic of ovarian cancer okay guys i hope this video is helpful to you thank you